of the report, after which we'll open the floor for your comments, your feedback, and your recommendations. Let us welcome Honorable Levi Peter. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Cabinet colleagues, observers, Justice M. Raphael Masaga, representative of the Commonwealth Secretariat, Ms. Melin Glynn, representative of the Organization of American States, Mr. Dwight Lay, representative of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS, and Mr. Saz Gunraj, representative of CARICOM, as well as the chairperson, Ms. Karen Prevo, secretary to the cabinet, the um, former prime minister, Mr. Edison James, all other guests and attendees, one and all, good evening. As we are aware, we're here to consider the report of Sir Dennis Byron that was submitted earlier uh, this year, a couple of months ago. So Dennis submitted his report in two phases. Phase one, focus on what he described as cleansing of the register. And phase two, focus on what he described as institutional matters. I'll suggest that part three and part five of Sir Dennis's phase one report are the most significant of that report, the phase one segment. In particular, the issues of identification cards, registration of electors, residency, which I shall return to later in this um, presentation, and confirmation of registration are significant factors in the phase one report. The identification card issue, and um, we've been speaking about identification cards for a number of years now. Um, listening to the consultations over the past couple of weeks and discussions that have been taking place, identification cards are addressed by Sir Dennis in Clause 11 of his proposed New Registration of Electors Act. And he proposes that identification cards for the purpose of voting should become mandatory. The existing legislation provides for, for the use of identification cards, but it is not a mandatory requirement. The existing legislation leaves the discretion to the chief elections officer as to whether or not um, the cards should be used, and the manner is obviously left to the, um, the determination of the electoral office, chief elections officer, and commission. But there's no specifics. So Dennis is proposing that the card contain fingerprints. That is an issue with different views, which have uh, uh, arisen and are quite clear from the consultations, as well as Sir Dennis proposes that the card should be designated or termed, named a national identification card, but as we all know, some people believe it should be called a voter, voter's identification card. That obviously is a live issue for the consultation, and different people have different views, and I'm sure those of you who have a view will express it during the course of the consultation this evening. So then it's also proposed that public officers, some be compelled, obliged to provide information to the um, chief registering officer, that is to the elected office. He proposed that, for example, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs should provide names and, and details of officers who are working abroad. He also proposed that the chairman of the Mental Health Review Board should be required to provide information in respect to all persons who have been certified as having a mental disorder. Mental disorder is defined under the Mental Health Act as a mental illness or mental deficiency. Um, that is an issue which, during the course of consultation, some people have felt that um, a person's mental health history, uh, as their medical history, is private, 
and perhaps ought not to be disclosed uh, in the manner suggested by uh, or recommended by Sir Dennis. The, the view being, uh, at least one view being, that um, even if someone has uh, a mental health issue and it's recognized that if you um, follow the definition to its precise terminology, anxiety could be termed uh, a mental disorder. So there's, a, there's an argument from some that it shouldn't be required to be provided, but that's an issue, of course, that the consultation will also be able to determine based on views expressed. The, so Dennis also proposed um, that there be confirmation of the people whose names are on the register. Confirmation, as Sir Dennis proposes it, would be as follows. The Electoral Commission would be required within 30 days of the proposed Registration of Electors Act being uh, passed and assented to by the President, that is to say enacted, that the Electoral Commission would be required to declare a confirmation period. That confirmation period, according to Sir Dennis, should be no less than six months and no more than nine months of duration. The confirmation would empower the Electoral Commission to declare that, that a period. That period would be to facilitate registration of those people who are registered. So it wouldn't apply to people who want to, be, want to be registered but are not yet registered. If you're not registered and you uh, wanted to vote, you would have to go through the process that is necessary to be registered. Confirmation would only apply to people whose names were already on the list and who wanted to remain on the list. They would need to present themselves and satisfy the electoral officials of certain matters, of obviously their identity, etc., so as to remain on the, re on the list of um, voters or electors. The second phase of the report, so Dennis deals with access to the media, that he recommends that um, all political parties and all uh, candidates, in particular independent candidates, should have access to the um, state media. Um, the issue of some difference in respect to the ish, this matter of access to the media, as far as I've been able to understand it, is that some are of the view that so Dennis doesn't go far enough, that it shouldn't just be state media, that it should be extended to private media. That, of course, is something that for discussion and determination as part of the consultation process. The other matter that um, Sir Dennis recommended in relation to his phase two report is campaign financing. And those of you who have been following the discussions will know that there are varying views. Some people feel that campaign financing as proposed by Sir Dennis is not required at all. Others think that it is required. Some think that it doesn't go far enough. But it's, uh, what he recommends is um, campaign financing, and he expresses that there should be limits to the um, um, total amount that could be expended by any political party. And then he links the contributions that can be made and co or collected by political parties to percentages of the total expenditure that he indicated. The total expenditure that he indicated being um, $5 million, although he indicates that um, the Electoral Commission and indeed Dominica may decide to use an alternative figure, uh, of course, be that higher or lower. So then it's also recommended that the Electoral Commission should be increased, that's the number, its composition, the number of commissioners. Um, that's an issue which has, would, have its, would have its own challenges. In particular, it would require constitutional amendment, I suggest, because the number, the composition of the Electoral Commission is determined by the Constitution of Dominica, and so that would have to be changed so as to uh, accommodate that proposal. So Dennis also proposes that the Electoral Commission should have greater financial autonomy, greater autonomy in the appointment of staff, greater appointment in terms of appointment of committees, and um, that there should be a more uh, robust uh, and clear resignation procedure um, in respect to the commission.
So Dennis proposes a number of offences um, on the Clause 5 that's associated with um, the matters largely to do with campaign financing. Um, those penalties range from $6,000 or 12 months imprisonment to $10,000 or 12 months imprisonment. So Dennis also proposes the um, enactment of a new piece of legislation that he suggests should be um, named or entitled the Electoral Commission Act of 2023. So those are significant um, recommendations that Sir Dennis proposes. In addition, Sir Dennis proposes um, that The current arrangement or provision in the Registration of Electors Act, which, is, which provides a Clause 7C for a person who has been absent from Dominica for less than five years to be able to vote in an election. So Dennis proposes that that should be changed and that instead of it being that a person could come to Dominica if they're living abroad once in that period of five years and be able to continue to remain on the register. So, Je so Dennis proposes that it should be um, changed and instead a person should have to have spent at least 90 days in Dominica within that five year period or alternatively he suggests 50 days. That is to say if it's felt that 90 days is too long his suggestion is that the alternative should be 50 days. That's one, one school of thought. Another school of thought is that it should remain as it is, that a person who is absent from Dominica but returns at least once in five years should be able to remain on the list and to vote at elections. And a third option and suggestion is contended for, which is that there should be no limitation on a person. Once they're registered, they should remain registered and should only be removed from the list, A, if they request to be removed from the list, or B, if they die, in which instance their name should be removed. So those are three options, and um, there are people who argue for each of those, and a decision will need to be made by us, that is us as Dominicans, and due, in due course, as to which option we go with. Um, the proposal that Sir Dennis makes in respect to the issue of absence from Dominica is to be found at Clause 26.1 of Sir Dennis's um, um, suggested or proposed uh, Alternative Registration of Electors Act. Um, so those of you who have copies can find it there. I'm not going to read it, um, at least not at this point in time. The important, or an, an important factor, I suggest, in relation to the discussion of residence and absence from Dominica is to consider where does our law come from and where does the authority for the various decisions that we take come from. I think most of us will accept that the ultimate authority is the Constitution. The Constitution at section 33, subsection 2, A and B provide in clear terms for the registration of electors and for um, electors to vote. I will read section 33.2 because I think it's very important. Section 33.2 of the Constitution of Dominica provides as follows at 2A. Every Commonwealth citizen of the age of 18 years or upwards who possesses such qualifications relating to residence or domicile in Dominica, as Parliament may prescribe, shall, unless he is disqualified by Parliament from registration as a voter for the purpose of electing representatives, be entitled to be registered as such a voter in accordance with the provisions of any law in that behalf, and no other person shall be registered. You may have heard that passage, that section and subsection and paragraph read on previous occasions or articulated and been articulated as being a bar on 
people who are registered voting? I suggest not. And I would suggest, if you listen and if you read in your own terms, when you, if you don't have a copy now, when you go home or on your phone, it is quite clear that Section 33.2a is referring to the process of registration. So it is saying that there are qualifications relating to residence and domicile, as well as there may be others that Parliament may prescribe, which shall apply to a person who wishes to be registered. That's at A. Now we go to B. B says every person who is registered, that's not a person who is seeking to be registered, every person who is already registered, as aforesaid, in any constituency, shall, unless he is disqualified by Parliament from voting in that constituency in any election of representatives, be entitled so to vote. Be entitled so to vote in accordance with the provisions of any law in that behalf, and no other person may so vote. It is quite clear that B is dealing with a person who wishes to vote and what is the entitlement of a person who wishes to vote. I submit that Section 33, 2 of the Constitution is quite clear. A person who wishes to be registered must live in accordance with the provisions prescribed by Parliament within a particular cons constituency, namely the constituency that he or she wishes to be registered in, or for, depending on your choice of word, for at least three months immediately preceding the point of their application. Thereafter, once a person becomes registered, he or she is entitled to vote and continues, I suggest, to be entitled to vote unless, according to Section 33 2B, he is disqualified by Parliament from voting. The disqualification by Parliament is found at Section 6 of the Registration of Electors Act, which is Chapter 203 of our laws, and Chapter Sorry, Section 6 provides four heads of disqualification. One, a person is of unsound mind. Two, a person has, is serving a sentence of 12 months or more. Three, a person is under sentence of death in any Commonwealth country. Four, a person is disqualified by any other written law. As I understand and read section 33, you may differ, but as I understand it, and unless and until I'm persuaded otherwise by cogent argument, I submit that that is the law of the land. And what that means is that every registered person in Dominica has a right to vote. And I will very briefly cite two cases from all uh, jurisdiction that is two cases from our um, Court of Appeal, which um, actually uh, confirm that. The first is a case of Russell and the Attorney General of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's a 1995 case, and it can be found at volume 50 of the West Indian Reports, commencing at page 127. And in that case, the court held, the Chief Justice at the time, that the constitutional right conferred by Section 27 of the St. Vincent Constitution, which is identical to Section 33.2b of our Constitution, is twofold. The first is the basic right to be registered as a voter in the appropriate constituency. That right is granted to every citizen who is entitled to the basic right. That concomitant right is a right to vote in accordance with the provisions of any law in that behalf. This means that although the manner of voting is statutory or customary, the right to vote is inherently constitutional. And the second case is another from our jurisdiction. Again, Joseph Parry and Mark Brantley, it's a case from out of St. Kitts, 20, 2012 case, paragraphs 49 and 50 of that case read as follows. The constitutional right of enfranchisement is not in doubt. 
In Russell and the Attorney General of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, this court underscored and explained the nature of the rights guaranteed by an almost identical provision in the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Constitution. In applying the law and the regulations, preference must be given to recognition of the right to vote, and the legislation must be construed in a manner which promotes enfranchisement and guards against disenfranchisement. In other words, what those two cases in our jurisdiction are saying is that there is a right to vote, and that right is conferred to all those people who are registered dutifully and lawfully to, so to do. The issue of absence, which is inserted at um, section seven of the existing provision, and which um, Sir Dennis has uh, uh, replicated with um, some amendment at clause 12 of his proposed Registration of Electors Act is one which is quite clearly contentious, and I think all of the contentions must um, be heard and borne out, um, but I maintain that there is, according to my understanding of the Constitution, a constitutional right for people falling within that category. And, and finally, the issue of ordinary residence, which has been raised insofar as uh, seeking to uh, attribute that to the uh, issue of voting. In the Registration of Electors Act, the ordinary, ordinarily resident or ordinary resident is found 11 times. Five in the Registration of Electors Act and six in the Registration of Electors re Regulations. In the Act, it's, we have found at sections 11 and section 12. Both of those sections deal with the register and uh, the, if you will, the tidying of the register. And in particular, uh, it gets to 11.3, uh, reads as follows. The preliminary register shall not include persons who, in the opinion of the chief elections officer, appear since the publication of the last register so that Registers only contain names of people who are registered. So we cannot be talking about people who are not yet registered. It must be talking about people who are registered. It says, since the publication of the last register, A, to have died, those are the categories of people who shall not be included. B, not being citizens of the Commonwealth of Dominica, to have departed from Dominica on the 30th of March of any such year, to be no longer and sorry, and on the 30th of March of any such year, to be no longer ordinarily resident in that polling district, or C, being citizens of the Commonwealth of Dominica, to have been absent from Dominica for a period exceeding five years. And 11.7 deals with the, register, the registers of electors required by subsection one, which I just read, to be prepared and published in each year after 1979 shall consist of A, all persons who were registered in the Register of Electors last published for that polling district. Again, the Register of Electors published, people who are already on the list. And B, all persons whose names appear in the annual list of electors prepared under Section 12 for that polling district. Again, it's the persons of na names of persons who appear in a list. That is to say, people who are already registered. And since the date of publication of the registers mentioned in paragraph A, as ordinary resident in that polling district and qualified under this act as electors, but shall not include persons who in the opinion of the chief registering officer appear since publication of the registered mentioned to have died and the same thing as I read a few moments ago. So I say that to say, and there's more that could be said, but I, I don't wish to take up the time of the, those who wish to make contributions. I'll simply summarize this way. To say that ordinarily, ordinarily resident is a term which is in the, in the um, Registration of Electors Act. It has relevance, but I would submit to you that the relevance that it has is in relation to people who are already registered, and it, what it provides is that certain people, those who, who have died, those who uh, uh, may have spent more than five years out of Dominica and so forth, are not to be continued on the list. Now, some people might argue with that, some may say, as you heard me indicate earlier on, that it should be that once registered, always registered. But those are issues that will have to be discussed and determined according to the consultation process. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, AG. I know that there are some people coming in. Uh, if you're on the outside, they are sitting inside. Our ushers, our staff will assist you. Okay, so at this point, we are going to begin um, by opening up the floor for your comments and feedback. But before we do so, I just wanted to highlight that um, the issue of elections and voting is something that I understand we are very deeply passionate about uh, in Dominica. And that passion is very evident when we express our views on such matters. Um, after listening to the contributions over the last two weeks and, of course, last evening, I would like to request again that in the interest of a productive consultation that we focus on the matter at hand this evening, which is the recommendations of the Sudanese Byron Report. I know that many of you have been listening and you have been attending the consultations and we know that there are some very clear issues which the Attorney General has presented night after night. Some um, you may have read in the report yourself or you may have learned from listening to the consultations. And some of these include, as the AG said, the cleansing of the voters list. How should this be done? I really have been paying attention to the comments at the consultations. I have not heard much about the issue of um, confirmation or re-registration, what your views are on the method of cleansing the voters list. Uh, should anyone be removed from the list at all? We would like to hear from you on the matter of the identification card. Um, as the AG has said, there has been a lot of discussion about this. I think this has been probably one of the central issues that has been addressed by um, individuals attending these consultations. But we'd also like to know what you think about the voter ID, national ID card, or any form of identification re required for voting, and what type of biometric data should be on this card. There are other areas such as uh, the issue of financing of political campaigns, the expansion of the Electoral Commission, and other matters that Sudanese has highlighted. Um, the process that we'll follow as we have the other nights, if you would like to speak, please raise your hands. We will take notes of those who would like to speak. Uh, my officers will probably come around to get your names, so I don't have to say the man in the yellow hat or the man in the red hat. Um, I know a few of you, so I'll call you by name. And um, I would like to again request that we be reasonable in terms of the time of our intervention. We'd like to hear from as many of you as possible. And um, we would not like to keep you here too long this evening. So I would like to let me just see initially the hands that we have, and then we will go through. OK. So we, we will start with the parliamentary representative, Honorable Anthony Charles. And then we will go with the, the hands that I am seeing. So I'm taking, Ms. Dura is taking a note of the names. Mr. Charles. Uh, by the way, we will have a mic come to you to this evening because of our arrangements on the stage. So you will stand where you are and you will speak. Our officers will assist you with the mic. Good night. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Protocol has already been established, so we're going straight to this electoral modernization reform, whatever word. This started, some people will say it's Mr. James, Mr. Lennox, Honorable, but I beg to differ. This electoral reform started in my home when it was referred to as madness. Cleansing the voting list was referred to as madness when Richard Charles and Condwani Williams was attempting to remove 110 dead people, only 110 dead people 15 years ago. 15 years ago. So, yes, he's there. So, cleansing the list is not a just come thing. Back then, 15 years ago, 
Richard Charles was attempting to cleanse the list. Right now, it is still men being mentioned that we need to cleanse the list. By now, that list will have been cleansed. But we're going to move on to that because everybody with, uh, in confirmation that they need, need to cleanse. The list needs to cleanse and it's going to be cleansed. The next one is campaign financing. A lot of people have the campaign financing mixed up. The campaign financing, in my opinion, is not government giving parties and independent candidate money. The campaign financing is based on the amount of voters on your list in Marigot. You have 10 people, you can put a certain amount of money for each voter. So a dollar per person, $10. No party should send, spend more than $10 on their 10 voters. Dollar per person, that's it. We're not speaking about government giving no parties no money. That is not in that. You raise your money, you can raise your ten dollars, it's five, you can raise you raise it. But you just want to put a limit to make a level playing field. But campaign financing never had nothing to do with me. No. I had zero dollars and zero cents. Two weeks it only I only take two weeks because it's alleged that the Labour Party had millions, but that was not going to alter my winnings. Because I know where I stand. We all know where we stand when it comes to voting who we have to vote for. So it's not money that's going to persuade us. So moving on, voters' identification card. Now, the machine that was bought for one point something, whatever million dollars, don't make those people mislead you all again. The machine never come for no national identification card. It's a card machine. Whatever you want to calibrate and put in the machine, get out of the machine. So if you're making a national identification card, you can have something, I like to watch spy movie, that's something they call biochip. So you can put all your voting information in it and swipe it and you're getting it. Your constituency, your voters identification. So don't make this thing tied up with a, the machine is not a national identification card, it's a card machine. Whatever you fix it, you upgrade it to be, it will be. So stop confusing yourself in national identification card, voters identity card. Make a machine that is multi-purpose, a card that is multi-purpose. So when you put it, you can use it to go MoneyGram, you can use it to open an account. When you come to vote, you can swipe it, you get in all your numbers. It's a simple thing. We are carrying on in the thing about national Okay, let's move on. It has one thing that keeps choking me every time since I little boy. And my Good friend, late Prime Minister, may so recipes, Honorable Roosevelt Douglas. He, after the 2000 election, he stopped at Lions. He tell us this in the news tonight or tomorrow morning. And I listen to the news in the night, I listen in the morning. This not in the draft in the AG. I want us to draft up something for that. Because this coming, it has some people I want to call them razor blade. I'll call them a chainsaw. They're cutting right wrong. Right wrong. So you see this thing that they're feeling. I'm going to use myself as an example, you know. I must take the independent votes I get and just come and just jump and go on Labour Party seat. Oh, 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 that, oh, that going there? And everything is dandy and nice. Well, Margaret have their own constitution. That will not happen. So now, you're telling me, if... 400 people vote for me. 350 agree for me to cross. You don't think that 50, if I was on a different seat, would be a very deciding vote? What I would like to be recommended immediately after you decide to cross it for after election, immediate by election. Simple. So we'll see now who was voting for you and who want to vote for you now. Because all you're moving like chainsaw. Cutting right wrong. You're misleading the people. The people that vote for you as an independent candidate, my brother, if you don't want to win the people that thing, resign and come to the independent thing. Don't come and jump in on cross. Since 2000, people are jumping from everybody area. And yak, 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 yak. No, that needs to stop. We're moving on. Access to media. GIS, DBS. No disrespect, you know. This media thing here to me, that is null and void. I don't need media. Facebook, Twitter. WhatsApp, status, those things there is just 
For example, you know what I need that for? On September 14th, right here, I'm going to have a town hall meeting. That's all I need that for. So look at advertising the town hall now. September 14th, we're having a town hall. That's all I need that for. I don't need no media to go and advertise my campaign. Margot, people are going on the road on the streets, walk on the ground and campaign. All those on the day on radio, talking, talking. Come on the ground and campaign. It's on the ground and campaign, you know. I never had time to go to media. How much media people call me? I don't want to go to media and tell what? For all the know our business, but right here I say and take care of my business. I don't want to media. It's a Facebook, Twitter, all thing. Word of mouth, the best. This media thing, they, but if you want to go to media, that's your business. Isn't it? DBS called me, my friend Cecil Joseph called me. I said, nah, that's okay. I don't have nothing to say. I'll take care of my girl. I, I only go. I don't need no media. I okay. I'll advertise my meeting. No, we're gonna move on again. No. Why say there? In one of those elections. Um I feel to call it. Next night yet my past parallel saying, Well, call it now. I say, Well, what is that now? Boy? And next night, yeah, it's Dimitri that have. Then time, the Dimitri couldn't even talk. It's Google Gaga. So yeah, it's Dimitri that have the thing. You see, all those things, Mister, to make the level playing field. Cause now I want to know when I have to start to campaign. So we need a set date. Because now, when you build in a house, your contractor have to give you a set date when you go to his foundation. When you go to when you go that. You see this thing about I feel to call it, and I didn't call it. And whole term election term people running campaign. I don't like that. Set a date. The constitution, eh, it's so weak. But back in the day, people used to move on principle. People don't have principle no more. People don't have no principle no more. Sometimes I don't have principle. Sometimes I assume my principle dragging sometimes. So I can't even trust myself to even keep a date and say no. Set it in the constitution. The constitution have too much loopholes. The constitution have loopholes until a machine bought since when the manager's there. So no constitution can tell them make the machine and put the ID. The, uh, all money just wasting. It's too weak. So you see right now, this old, according to my friend Boston last night, show man, this thing here, yeah, this old colonialism, old folk ways and trusting your word, we can't trust people with no more. Because some people say, I feel like calling it, and it's in their pocket. When you think it's a national disaster, they're thinking, I any promise I'm in the election, I think, what? Okay, no, we want to set date. If it's every five years, because we can't take people away. Because when all of us leave, it's the same calamity again, they're going to be using it. Late Damien Junior Charles, she called an early election too. My former parent called an early election. From ever since, I even think Labour Party, all elections, we never set date. All of them is a different type. December, December, this three, two years. To me, I am, we pretty big people. I mean, everybody big, but all the pretty people emotions. Set a date. Just set a date. What is wrong with setting a date? So everybody know every four years, every five years, that's it. Just set a date. Now, to those overseas voters that there, I want to be legible. And who want to be legible? I want you to draft off a thing again, you know? Because everybody, they want to contribute, they love the Dominica. You see the tax you pay every Monday? It have a way to reach out to them. Tax them too. They so want to contribute. They want, they love the Dominica. Hey, um, Honorable Vince, they love the Dominica. So my sister, Kamisha, and June, and Philida must just come, send them a little barrel, send a little ticket for Jefan, and everything nice, and they just come in and vote and have to go back. Yes, they can put us in a good time or a bad time, but, but, they don't, at what cost to them, is us alone are getting, if it's a bad cause or a good cause, but it taxes people. They so want to vote, all of them want to come down, and they want to vote for their party, and they want to vote for Rasta Tony. Well, come, come, pay your tax every month like me. Just pay it. So you'll see now how much of them are going to pay the tax, and how much of them are going to think. So you, you don't rush in to pay it, you know. After you set the date, you have a confirmed date, you change all the registration, everything intact, the constitution intact. Now you tell them now, you reach out to them, and you tell them, ah, Okay, we don't know what category we're going to put you on. Okay. You're self-employed. Pay $120 a month. That's 45 U.S. Paid. No, you still have been rushing into pay every month, you know. When election call, you add it up and you calculate as you pay it. For you to stay on the list, pay it. Pay it. So after everything is set, again, for all those processes to go through, you have to fix the weak legislation. Because people don't move in on no trustworthy again. 
people are not loyal no more. You cannot take people's word. So you have to set those things there. Eh? Because don't think it's better not coming in. So when you say I lie down in my bed, I don't want to hear this kind of uh, arbitrary thing that we've, what we could have fixed already. So let's just fix this thing. And this thing, it looked like it's a, it looked like we were paying for nothing. 600 tall go to Byron. Look at that, how much snacks there. How much consultation we had so far. But all you're paying for that, man. That is finished, man. GIS don't get in over time, man. That, but wait a while now. But who, at who? At who? But who, who are paying for that? It's not me. It, it, but it's me. It's tax. It's all our money that paying for that, you know. So everybody wants to have consultation. Everybody wants to have things. And they're still going around. And they still want to fight. But uh, what happened, you know? You see the parliamentarians, my colleagues. I understand. But sometimes we have to give and take. Also on the opposition, the former opposition party, sometimes we have to give and take. We cannot get everything. We cannot get everything. So if the people name on their photo scared, just get everybody photo scared. Everybody want to flex their muscle and see how much power they have. Now, nah. yeah, who going to get the backlash? Is the ordinary citizens. It's always the ordinary citizens. So let's put away this partisan thing and deal with the people. Because if you don't live already democracy in Dominica, let me tell you, we have a problem. Well, I want to lie down and leave my door open as usual. And nobody will come back. I want to live in peace in my old age. I look getting younger and I'm getting older. So I try to fix those things. So just fix it, fix it, fix it, so we can all have a better voting system. It's a simple thing, don't complicate it. Good night. Thank you very much, Honorable Charles. So we have a few speakers lined up. Um, Mr. Edmund Henderson, Mr. Brian Linton, and Ms. Lynn Gordon will go in that, that order. Good night to everybody. Madam moderator, excuse me, I have to think my, my legs are not so strong, so I have to use my seat for my support. Ladies and gentlemen, I've listened attentively to what is happening to do with the electoral reform. I want to first say that I'm not a lover of reading. So since I was going to school, I couldn't score any points on reading. I only read what I must read and what can bring you know, some values to me. So the question of this Byron report, I haven't read it, but from what I heard about it, even if I could read, I wouldn't spend valuable time to read that garbage. Point number one, that's garbage. However, I'm interested in ele electoral reform. Now, based on my understanding, the laws that we have on our book, that's enough to use, if we use them effectively and properly, and genuinely, sincerely, we don't even need electoral reform. Here. My understanding is, my understanding is, we talk a lot of disenfranchisement. Let me take my time to call you all well. For Dominicans who live outside, but the thing is, the first person who disenfranchises himself or herself is he who leaves Dominica and go away. That's the first thing. The second thing I know, I get to know, is that when you go, let's use America. If you go to America and you want to be an American, you want to live there to get the benefits that are there, you have to renounce or denounce whatever your citizenship. In doing that, I also understand that if you, if for some reason or the other, there's going to be a war between America and the country that you come from. You have to sign to agree with the American law that you will pick up the guns for America against Dominica. Ladies and gentlemen, how after you do all that, you can come and tell me you are a citizen and you're entitled to vote. I had the opportunity to go away 
like plenty of the people who went. And I said to a lot of them I knew, I could have gone long before you and come back even before you go. Okay? I've traveled extensively. I earned three U.S. 10 years passport already. Every time I travel, I've traveled about five times. Then every time I travel, it gives me six months. I've never stayed more than a week. That's to tell you how much I love Dominica. And you see my red shirt? I'm a liberal, you know. I'm a liberate. Okay? But the thing is, the thing is, I work and I have to be Labour Party. I paid my dues in Labour Party. During the time of um, Ruthie Douglas, Pierre Charles, okay? I used to leave myself and some colleagues in Margaret and take my vehicle and drive all to Point Michel, all to La Plaine, all to Cottage, all to Grand Bay to campaign for those Labour candidates. Okay? And I love my Labour Party. But from the disappearance of Rosie Douglas and Pierre Charles, the Labour Party that I knew is not there anymore. It has disappeared. Okay? So I was left asking myself a question and deciding what to do. Should I remain calling myself a labor right and getting involved in those dirty, nasty comments I'm seeing there? Could I do that? I could not do that. So I had to make a choice to move away from the Labour Party and to try my best to see how I can work harder as a farmer, to maintain my family, and to even help people. You understand? and to help to change the old bad governance that is there, okay? And my problem, my biggest problem is that I think we have done some work. The opposition people, the patriots, those who concern about Dominica, those who really love Dominica, I think we have done a lot to have changed that government already so that things can be better. You know what problem? Our problem is those same people who left and ran away from the misery they were seeing here. They couldn't make ends meet, so they had to go. And where they went to is better for them because they are enjoying all their benefits. They are better off than us. But the problem is there are some of them, there are some of them, Mr. Chairman, who went there and they didn't do well. They mal to Hawaii. They didn't do well. And so they're out there sleeping in what we call it trailer house and them kind of stuff like that. You understand what I mean? And they now, if you've given them the opportunity, all the love, they love Dominica. All the love, you see, they love Dominica. If you tell them to come and vote in Dominica and they have to pay the passage, my question is how many of them are going to come? They're not going to come. But what they are doing is that is a business they are doing. Every time an election comes, they wait for the money. And you know where they're wicked? Let me tell you where they're wicked. They know, they know that the money that the government is paying them to come here to disenfranchise us is the same money. If they had loved Dominican and Dominicans, it's the same money that should be allowed to be used to fix the road, to buy fertilizer for the farmers, to fix the seawater that mashing up our, tra our transport over there. So they don't like us. They like themselves. They like themselves. Madam Chair, I want to tell you, I want to tell you, I want to advise us, electoral reform is good is the way to go. If we love Dominica, Mr. Mr. Prime Minister, I hope you listen to me. If we love Dominica, Mr. A.G., you will know better than me because I'm a farmer and you're a lawyer. So you know the law better than me, you know what to do better than me. If we love Dominica, show Dominica love. Give the people electoral reform. Let the people decide for themselves 
what they want. Electoral reform is not, let me say something else, eh? you see me? I wasn't even, I wasn't even, I didn't know anything about electoral reform before. What was on my mind was to overthrow government. Cool. That was on my mind. And that is not what we're talking about now. Because what a coup means is that a coup form and throw the government away is gone, you're gone. But electoral reform means, Mr. A.G., listen to me. Electoral reform means that is a is an even playing field for everybody. So even the prime minister, even the prime minister, who is now trying not to give us electoral reform, he himself have an opportunity to come and contest in the election. And your people love you. You love your people. You're giving them houses. You're giving them everything. They should vote for you. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Madam Chairman, through you, I want to advise Mr. Prime Minister and those people who are in charge, AG, there's something that the consultations are going around the meetings, a lot of people saying, young people not following, young people not interesting. I want to tell you all that that is not true. What young people are saying, they don't have time to waste. It's like I'm coming here to talk, young people are going to do that. What young people are waiting for is when we beg, and we beg, and we beg for what we want in Dominica, and we can't get it. Then we talk, we ask, we beg, and young people will act. Okay? And that might not be the best thing for Dominica. That might not be the best thing for Dominica. If you say you love Dominicans, do the thing that is right. I want to echo something to the observers as well. I don't know where they go. Mr. Hey observers. We would be grateful if you can wrap up. There are lots of other speakers, so we'd like give to give a, everyone an yeah, opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah, but give me a break. Give me a, all you get in, all you get in pay to clap, you know. All you know all you get in pay to clap. So you can clap. No. Madam Chairman, the 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 observers, the very observers that were here and still listening, they are the same ones that all those recommendations from the OAS and the, all of them have, you know, provided to them. The same electoral reform recommendation. They are prevented to dominate our country. Nothing was done with it. Where are they? Why is the Byron? The Dennis Byron Corbett that we're interested in. We're not interested in that. We're interested in true electoral reform for Dominicans, not for labor rights. Labor rights are telling me to stop their clapping. Let me warn you. One of the things I always try to tell you, Dominica is for Dominicans and not for labor rights. Please bear that in all your mind. So when all you feel all you can go all about and heckle people when they're talking, like what happened last night, be careful at all you're doing. Please be careful. Because Dominica is for Dominicans, not labor rights. A warning on you. Okay, so let me see what I'm saying. So I am saying, I am saying, we need electoral reform, not Byron Commerce. Well done, Dominica, electoral reform. And I want to again echo and drive home that the people who you're paying the passage to come here to vote. If they want to come and vote, let them come on their own, because I know they won't come. They cannot pay the passage. Okay, Mr. Henderson, we we do appreciate your points, but I do have about 12 speakers on my list here who are also other members of your community who would like to contribute. Okay, yeah, but let me just make that okay, last so point. Okay, so can you please wrap up? Let me up? just make that last point. Thank let you. Let me just make that last point. Let me just make that last point. Let me just make that last point. I want to ask us again, Mr. A.G., Prime Minister, everybody, even the observers too. We're not in charge of Dominica. We're not in charge of the world. It's God that is in charge. And God only allows you to do a certain amount. And when you see you do too much and you make God unhappy because God has set his plan for us to live in his world. And when we come out of God's plan, 
and want to go in our plan, our own plan, and ask God to come in it, God will not come. He will destroy us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Henderson. And again, just reminding all the speakers to be mindful that there are a number of individuals who would like to contribute. Um, we have made the point that let, let's focus. We have made the point that we would like to hear the people's views on electoral reform. So once we make our point, let's move on and allow other speakers to speak. And I would like to again urge everyone to be as brief as possible with your intervention. Uh, Mr. Brian Linton and then Ms. Lynn Gordon. Madam Chairman, welcome to, to Marigot. Madam Chairman, last night I was watching the proceedings and my heart ached for you, Madam Chairman. The bad behavior of the clappers in Roseau last night, it was disgraceful. There was a point in time even I heard the chairman appealing she wished she had sergeant of arms because she wasn't feeling to put out some of those clappers who were behaving real disorderly. Madam Chairman, we need to understand why we are here. We are here because according to the CCJ, elections in Dominica have been tainted. I hope the observers are hearing that, you know. It's not us who are saying that. Tainted may be a very big word, big English, tainted. In other words, elections in Dominica have been stolen. They have not been free and fair. Not us saying that. That is the CCJ saying that you all have been stealing elections in Dominica. And we are here to try to see how we can protect our election from further theft from you all. That is the problem that we have there dealing with. So that's why when we call about voter ID card, we want to deal with an ID card specific to voting so that we can take care of the thiefing that's going on during election. That's what we happen in here. When we talk about um, residency, it's because we want to protect ourselves from the illegal mercenary votes that you all have waiting. Cannot support themselves to even buy a ticket for themselves to come down and cast a vote. Have to depend on a gift of a ticket from you every five years because things are bad from, from them. You understand? So that is why we are here. We want to protect ourselves from those types of people, brothers and sisters. Because they ran from the country. Remember, they ran from the country. They run from the country. Look how Mr. Rivers, you know, my good friend Greg. Raise your hand for the observers to see you. He sang the Calypso. Rose giving me blows. Rose giving me blows. Referring to Roosevelt's spirit, giving us blows in Dominica with her old shoe. Look him there. <laughs> Mr. Rivers, that's what we are dealing with. Okay? I want to address the elephant in the room tonight. The elephant in the room. The elephant that everybody is afraid to address. You know that elephant, observers? The CBI program. That is what is affecting all our elections we are talking about here. The directive, number one. The directive from Tony Astafan in 2008. You heard our pal rep talk about Richard Charles, who happens to be his father, trying to give us a clean list. Our pal rep exposed them tonight. And what did they do? They fired Richard Charles under the instructions of Tony Astafan. And they brought in Duncan Stowe and Alec Lawrence. All of them passport peddlers selling our passport. And they're there right now protecting their interests, serving on the Electoral Commission, frustrating the work of electoral reform in Dominica. They know that. That is what they're doing. You check? So the Electoral Commission is now overwhelmed by CBI passport peddlers protecting their interests, drawing millions, opening big buildings around Rosu every day while you're suffering. That is what we're doing. I see Brother Shanks is here from Salisbury. The commission through their passport peddling chairman. What they have done, they have willingly surrendered their authority and function to the DLP. Right now you have Mr. Daru, look him there, as the czar 
of election mat. Yes, he's there, Mr. Daru. Wave your hand for people to see you. Let me tell you something else about Mr. Daru that you all do not understand and keep in your head. Mr. Daru is the most connected minister after Skerritt and Melissa to MMCE. Anthony Hayden and them. That is their point, man. So I hope you all see the picture that we are starting to develop here. MMC has to make sure that they control elections in Dominica as well. So they have put their point man in the cabinet. Dr. Daru, their point man, has to be in charge of election business in Dominica. I hope the, I hope the observers recognize him. That's what we're talking about there. Under the LP control, Skerritt has appointed Kenny Daru, a labor elected government minister, as the underboss or the czar of general elections in Dominica. Mr. Daru, we all know, is very well connected to Anthony Hayden. That name there, Anthony Hayden, they outlaw it in parliament. The old speaker will ask anybody who call Anthony Hayden name. If you're not calling Anthony Hayden name in our parliament to worship him, do not mention his name because the speaker will call sergeant and arms to put you out. You must only mention Anthony Hayden name in the parliament of Dominica if you're worshiping him as a god. Because if not, the speaker, the speaker that cool the bakery, that now cool in the house of assembly, will deal with you if you mention Anthony Hayden's name. But we are calling it here. You check? Anthony Hayden. Yes, yes, testing, testing. I am saying it is in the interest of Anthony Hayden that Roosevelt Skerritt remains in power till Jesus comes so that he can continue to own the CBI program. He's the owner of it. You heard a confession from Mr. Skerritt some years ago when Lennox wrapped him up in the parliament. He said if he had to put report the full amount to the consolidated fund, it would be $2.1 billion. But because of the housing program, which is external in the control of Anthony Hayden, the, the budget is only $1.1 billion. Skerritt admitted that Anthony Hayden is the man controlling our money outside. Okay? They don't, they don't understand that. We're going to make them understand that today. Our CBI Mr. program... Mr. Linton. Yes, Madam no, no, Chairman. Just, I, I'm just linking... Just one my, minute. Yes. I, I would like to, again, remind us of why we are here. I don't want to... I yes. want to allow us to contribute, yes, yes, but yes. I would like us to focus on the yes. reports and the yes. recommendations yes. of the report. So yes. if you can yes. Yes. I'm try your best I'm to linking. focus and get Ma to the Madam, point. Madam Chairman, I'm just setting the groundwork for me to make the linkage well, the to the report. Let's move yes. on. From yes, the we're moving on. Stop the interruption. We are to understand that our CBI program is a multi-billion dollar asset. You think a man would want to, to lose a multi-billion dollar asset, Anthony Hayden? Okay? Through MMC and the network of passport peddlers, Anthony Hayden is the main financier. That's why they have problem with election finance reform, you know, campaign finance reform. Anthony Hayden is, Madam Chairman, you notice how I link in everything? Anthony Hayden is the main financier of all DLP political activities in Dominica. Skerritt has publicly admitted that already. Okay? The other point, we come in down, Madam um, Chairman. DLP continue to, to admit in their utterances. You see how all you behave there and the things all you're saying? All you must listen to all you can sell very carefully. Because what you're all admitting is that you all have boldfacedly stolen the election and this has become intolerable to the people and an embarrassment for you all. That's why you all are here right now, trying to convince people to legitimize stealing and bribing and treating. 
because of because you have admitted that you have been stealing elections. So to come out of that embarrassment, let us make it law now. We're moving on, Madam Chairman. We're moving on. The suggestion to set up registration offices in four selected countries, that was in the report, Madam Chairman, if you notice. See, in selected countries in the diaspora is to facilitate their mercenary votes from their bases that they have set up over the years. Okay, this, this suggestion reeks of Anthony Hayden because that is to facilitate CBI voters, mercenary voters. We're moving on. The DLP attack on voter ID cards suits Anthony Hayden's economic citizens who do not have residence in Dominica. I hope you all know, heard the Attorney General at the beginning in the overview reading and outlining the residency requirement, which is key. I hope you all know that. He tried to bury it and so on. You check, but he, he had to do his job as a servant of the public and read the law as the law is. Okay, I hope you know that. The DLP attack, yes, on the ID cards, that is to facilitate the mercenary voters. The objective of DLP election reform is to legitimize the continuance of Anthony Hayden's scary dictatorship in Dominica. And finally, Madam Speaker, finally, Madam Chair, sorry. I'm thinking of the speaker. My heart is paining for the speaker that just gone, but we have a better Alex Boyd night than the one who just passed. Number 10, number 10, the last, finally, finally, we heard Mr. Nanton last week Thursday Yes. He came into the office. I don't know if he came in by helicopter. I do not know what was his mode of transport, but he came in. He landed in Melvin Hall in London Derry via helicopter, I suspect. We heard this gentleman. Last Thursday, Nanton revealed that he is deeply... Observers, I hope you're listening to me. I see you put your hand by your ear, sir. Mr. Nanton, last Thursday, the gentleman who spoke at London Derry, he came in. That was one of the government operatives. He's a starring on Al Jazeera. <laughs> so if you want to verify what I'm saying there, you can check Al this Al Jazeera report. He's a star in there. Yes. Na that, we're talking election business. Nanton, he revealed by his own mouth that he's deeply involved in the management of DLP financial operations, walking around with checks in his wallet to meet DLP election campaign expenses, okay? This is the former head of the corrupt CBI program, you know, that was there last week, Thursday, observers, in, in Melvin, in London, cursing all United Workers' Party leaders, Mr. Nanton, former head of the same CBI program. And if you notice, he have checks coming out in all parts of his pocket. He have, he have Labour Party identification cards, you know, observers but he doesn't want us to have a national a voter ID card for ourselves. He said he said he have to be printing Labour Party cards but thousands every day. That's why he have checks for the printers and they just have checks. They just have money. You know, C CBI money because he was the former head of the CBI. Mr. Skerritt said the other day that he, they elevated him. So I do not know if they took off his head as CBI and they elevated his head, but he was elevated to some other position. Why? Because during his tenure, during the tenure of Mr. Nanton as the head of CBI, uh, what, what resulted in that is right now, Dominicans traveling to England, we have to get visas to go to England because of how they corrupted the, the passport program to steal elections, to maintain power. So that is what we are here today. That is why we are here today because we are trying our best to prevent this Labour Party government from continuing stealing elections because they, they cannot afford to lose control of their CBI program because they actually told you, if not CBI, what? And then you heard Attorney Carol Winston last night that they hung it off. You heard her mention that CBI is the government's biggest source of revenue. Over 60% of our GDP is financed by the CBI program. So you see how important it is that the owner of the CBI program, Anthony Hayden, 
must by all costs have this government so that he can continue to own his CBI program. Thank you very much. Madam Chairman, you are a very good thank chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Linton. you, thank you. I, I, I would like to advise again, um, as much as we are giving liberties to express your views and opinions, that we remain focused on the reason for why we are here tonight. Everybody who speaks keeps saying why we are here tonight, but why we are here tonight is because we would like to discuss the recommendations of the report. We have clearly outlined some areas that um, you may wish to comment on, and I would like to urge us to remain focused. Uh, the next speaker we have is Lynn Gordon, then we have Mr. Stewart Paris and Williams. Wignant Williams, Lynn Gordon, can we get the mic to Lynn Gordon, please? Good night to all and to the chair. Protocol is already established. Yes, I must say, democracy is alive in Dominica. It is. Tonight, I have a few points I would like to make. Um, first thing I am um, saying, I think we should go for the national ID card, which can be used for any purpose, okay? My other point is not wanting a people, our people living overseas to vote. I think this five-year thing should be no more. Our, the, our people have uh, everything in, in, in the country. They have their house, they have lands, they have everything, and they want to come and vote, they're going, let them come and vote. Okay? It is not fair to them. Making all kinds of contributions in Dominica. And as soon as we have a problem, we are calling on them to send us what little they have. Eh? And I, I, I think they should make their own decision if they want to vote or not. Okay? We are talking about America fixed date for election. Let us not only look on one side of the coin, because America is sending all their ballots all over for their people for them to come and vote. You understand? My other point is, I don't think the Treasury should give any money to any political party that wants your election. None. You want to run your election? Find your money. You cannot just sit down on your loins and expect to get money from the treasury to run your election. I'm not supporting that. Get your own funds. No? You cannot be, we cannot be going all around and saying things are bad in the country, things are bad in the country, and yet you want to take money out of the treasury? No. To campaign? No. That is wrong. I would like to find out, after taking all that money from the treasury, hmm, what is going to happen to us after you win the election? You want to run, t run things? Get off your lazy self up and find your funds. The Bible says a lazy man should not eat. And I want to say here tonight, we can huff and we can puff, but we will not blow the house down. This is my contribution tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gordon. Uh, let's have Mr. Stewart Paris, and then Wayne Good Williams. Madam Chair. Madam, go ahead, Mr. Paris. I think we can hear you. Madam Chair, lady, members of the observer groups represented here tonight, the Attorney General, members of Parliament, all the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I want to commend and recognize the effort of all those 
in the Commonwealth of Dominica, who for several years now has been working assiduously with pure intentions to help us to, to get electoral reform. And in this regard, I'd like to specifically acknowledge Mr. Richard Charles, who's sitting at my, at my back here, who, um, for his efforts several years ago, for which he got in trouble, an effort which was targeted with hard work and pure intentions in an effort to achieve genuine electoral reform in the Commonwealth of Dominica. However, I have been following some of these sessions which are supposed to be consultative in nature and we should be seeking to secure the best results for the people of Dominica. And I am very disappointed with some of the things I hear and the posture I see on display by some in attendance and some who are making presentations. The rhetoric, the rhetoric I hear coming from some of these sessions is disturbing to say the least. I believe someone should be able to differentiate between a political campaign and a consult consultation. Yeah, I believe someone listening should be able to differentiate between a political campaign and a consultation on electoral reform by its tone and content. However, unfortunately, I must say that I don't find some of these sessions any different to the same old thing that we are accustomed to do and has been doing for the last two decades that has taken us nowhere. It is my personal view that at this, at this point, this whitey, kubuli, nature island commonwealth of Dominica is at the crossroads. And the next move we make will be significant. And it will hold some serious implications for us, our children and our children's children, for the rest of time and probably for eternity. Everyone will agree with me that the reason why we're here tonight and why we are seeking to reform our present electoral process is because we have found it to be flawed and broken and it must be fixed. Otherwise, we would never be wasting all this time and financial resources in an exercise that is futile. However, the way some people conduct themselves at these sessions that we call consultation seem to suggest that we are prepared to squander this opportunity and put our country on the path to a dismal future and certain failure. But notwithstanding, if we can bring ourselves to regard and appreciate the value of this opportunity we have and use it properly, and if we get it right this time, the future security, the future stability, and the future prosperity of Dominica and the rule of law in this country will be guaranteed for a long time in the future and will make Dominica one of the happiest places to live on the planet. If we get this right, we can bring Dominica to the stage where the greenery of our grass will certainly be a lure to the many of our friends and families who have fled to North America in search of economic rescue. If we get it right, they will not have to be thinking of coming back home to vote. They will be thinking of coming back home to live. But we have the opportunity now to fix it instead of using these consultations to come and argue about our political preferences and what we would like to protect. But ladies and gentlemen, if we get it wrong, we will not recover, you know. Never. We will not get out of the hole. 
The Haitian people got it wrong some years ago. They did not fix it when they could. They used the time to argue for politics and, and party, the politics and party of their choice, while the country was ruling gradually toward the cliff, with their children and their children's children on board to face doomsday with their eyes wide open. There's a thing called the, the law of inev inevitable eventuality. If you keep doing things a certain kind of way, something will give one day and you will get a certain kind of result. We need to stop behaving as though this electoral reform consultation process is an opportunity for us to defend the party and the politics of the United Workers Party. And the Labour Party, and the Dominica Labour Party, the Dominica Freedom Party, and the private politics and ideologies of other groups and individuals. We have to stop behaving like that if we want any good result out of this for the people of Dominica. I do believe that our electoral process in Dominica must be governed by the rule of law. If the law say that you have to attain the age of 18 years to be eligible to vote, it is unlawful for you to try to vote at age 16. If the law says that your name have to be on the registered list of electors in order for you to be eligible to vote, you should not try to vote if you're not registered. The process should be gov governed by the rule of law. If we don't like the law and if it's not working for us, we use the process to change it. But until it's changed, we have to abide by the law. I have no problem now. I have no problem with people in the diaspora voting in our national election. As much as they have maintained a selfless interest in the welfare and prosperity of Dominica and its people, and on their own volition and deliberate action, they expend their own resources to come here to cast their vote at election time, and all subject to the rule of the law governing the election process. However, if their only motivation to come to vote in Dominica is free transportation and free pocket change, then that is fraudulent and immoral, and it is a threat to national interests. Lastly, on the issue of residency. No, however, I want to make this point. If in order to take on citizenship of another country, one would have to renounce his or her Dominican citizenship, that individual should never be allowed to cast the vote in a national elections of the country whose citizenship they have renounced. If you have to renounce your Dominican citizenship to take on another citizenship, why do you want to come back and vote in a country where you have renounced your citizenship? It makes no sense to me. My grandmother, I spend more time with my grandmother than with my mother. My grandmother always used to say in Marigold Palace, common sense beat education. And this is not rocket science. You can't renounce your citizenship. Take on citizenship in another country. Nobody never forces you to leave here. Nobody never forces you to renounce your citizenship. You have the right and the choice to do what you want. But if you renounce your citizenship, you cannot expect to come back and vote. On the question of voter ID card, I cannot understand what is the argument and pushback about voter ID card. While I stand corrected, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot think of one jurisdiction in the Caribbean region or sub-region that does not have a voter ID card to help in the safeguard of its electoral process. In fact, I believe, and I stand corrected again, that Mr. Dennis Byron need to have a voter ID card 
on election day in his jurisdiction to cast his vote. Someone need to enlighten me on what it is that is so unique about Dominica, that it must be the only one in this group of jurisdictions in the Caribbean region that should not have a voter ID card as a safeguard against fraudulent election, fraudulent voting and election rigging. Lastly, on the issue of residency, my father is from the Kalinago territory, but I am domiciled in Marigot. So I never try to register in the Kalinago territory because I'm not domiciled there. And I never try to vote there in a constituency where I do not live because it is my understanding that it is unlawful to do so and because I believe that the conduct of all serious and honest citizens of Dominica will be keen to conduct themselves in a national election in accordance with the rule of law. And finally, it is my wish and my hope that when this consultative process is over and concluded, we will end up with a legislation that will protect the right of every eligible voter and it will protect the integrity of the electoral process for Dominica and the future of its people. I thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Paris, for your contribution. Uh, the next speaker will have Wingard Williams, and then we'll have Mr. Edison James, and then Jennifer, Jennifer Abraham. Wingard Williams. Madam Speaker. Chair. Thank you. <laughs> okay, it catches. Um, is it on? Testing. Okay, for better songs. Good night to everyone. Okay, um, after all this information, misinformation, accusations, com condemnations, love speech, hate speech, all we want is a process that is an electoral process that is simple, secure, and efficient. Madam Chairman, I'd like to ask a question. Does the Commonwealth or does the Democratic Republic of Dominica, known as the Commonwealth of Dominica, does the Constitution give all citizens the right to vote? Does it? I'm asking a question. Does the Constitution, somebody answer me please. I, I will answer for, for Madam Chair. And uh, I think you would have heard what was read from the Constitution. Section yes. 33 2 B mm -hmm. gives every citizen who is registered on the register of electors the right to vote. Okay, thanks for the correction. So every citizen who is registered on the electoral list has or have or has sorry the privilege or the right to vote is this correct no we have to be careful i want to know you know if your name is on the electoral list do you have a right to vote because this is a consultation Go ahead. The AG has responded twice. Huh? I said the AG has responded twice, so yes, you can yes. proceed. Okay. Yes. Okay. So what I want to say is that, and I'll begin by answering the questions of the consultation, not just going off on a tangent. 
with in terms of um, media access. I think all political parties have media access. Period. All political parties have media access. No matter what media, I think it is so. But it can be en enhanced. Everything can be improved. Okay? On voters' list, I don't believe in um, termination of the voters' list. All right? Because, ma uh, Madam Chairman, I believe that um, ethnic cleansing began by terminating a list. All right? And I find it kind of serious if we all get up one morning in Dominica and the electoral list has been terminated. Nobody on the list. Every, oh, yeah, what does that mean? When we just wipe out the list completely? What does that mean? Anything can happen. All right? So I don't believe in terminating of the list. All right? Uh, okay? In terms of um, ID cards. ID cards. I think I believe in a national ID card. I believe in a card that you can use for all purposes not only for voting, all right? Imagine if you have just one card for voting, anything can happen. You can lose that card. You can go to the um, polls and the card is not in your pocket, all right? So we have to be very careful. We have to make sure we have something which is very simple. In case of re residency, I, I haven't heard of anybody, please um, correct me if I'm wrong, leaving Dominica and going overseas and asking for refugee status. Has this ever happened? Because I, I, I tend to get the idea that people are fleeing from Dominica. And I believe that people have left Dominica on their own free will, on their own accord. All right? And they did so for valid reasons. Very valid reasons. And most of them live and work in the, in the diaspora. They send remittance back home. They build homes. They buy property. All right? And all these are rights. I think they are rights given by the Constitution. All right? Education. They spend on education. They spend money almost in every sector of Dominica. They invest. They save in the banks and credit unions. They even take loans. What is the talk about them paying taxes? What I believe, since those people, since the diaspora has been helping with the development of Dominica, they too, as registered citizens, should be allowed to vote. I'm wiping out that five years thing. Once you're a Dominican, registered to vote, all right? And you are in constant contact, and most of them are in constant contact, virtual contact, because the other day somebody from the diaspora had to direct me to go somewhere over video to get to somewhere I wanted. So they are there and they are helping. So when we give the talk like they just leave and run away and they're not doing anything again, I, I, I think that's not, that's not right, okay? That's not right. And in terms of, of a date for election and Paul Rep. I think that um, our, our um, constitution is based, our parliament is based on the Westminster model. It's based on the Westminster model. And I don't know anywhere um, in the Commonwealth uh, where, 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 where countries have um, election date in their pocket. All right? Uh, so, sorry, not election date in their pocket, but a fixed date for election. What I think is that all parties should be prepared all right, be like, this. Be, be like a scout. Be prepared so that whenever election comes, you are ready. You should be ready at all times. You can never tell when an election is coming, just like how Tony was ready. Okay, and we're ready for our other one too, okay? So I think that's about all. I really did prepare something, but I decided not to go into it to make this as short as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Williams, for your contribution. Uh, Mr. Edison James, can we have the mic to him, please?
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I had prepared to be at the podium, but you have decreed otherwise, so I'll stay where I am. Let me um, be presumptuous and to add my own voice, words of welcome to everybody who's here. And, um, you know, after the parish hall brawl, it must be so wonderful to have this nice gathering here. No fuss, no fight after the parish hall brawl. I'm a little bit disappointed that I have not uh, seen here tonight the last night's acting prime minister. Is he here? Not here. And the minister for agriculture, because they both have Margaret connections. And I'd love to have, and you have Margaret connections as well? And I'd have loved to welcome the minister as um, Knight, uh, in particular. Um, Laville, Laville, sorry. Um, the purpose of the consultations, the purpose of the consultations, and they've been going on. You know, I went to the parish hall consultation. By the way, I was there because at that time there was no indication that my community was going to be a host in one of those uh, consultations. And even when you shifted to the northeast, it was Benz to Margaret. So I went to, to, to Woodford Hill. And then you shifted and you gave us uh, opportunity. That's why I'm at all three of them, okay? Uh, so the consultations have been going up to that time when I was at the parish hall. And all those consultations at the parish hall seem to have gone so well. At the state hall, sorry. No, the parish hall, oh, I don't know why it's on my mind. At the state house, they seem to have gone so well. People presented. Um, there was hardly any segueing into the rank politics. Although, once you talk in electoral reform and electoral matters, there will be some element of party politics coming in. But it was minimal, except, of course, the um, priest who said that those who spoke against whatever the other side was saying, they, were, they hated Dominica, which I thought was a reprehensible position, and I stated that publicly, and I stated that to him as well. So what we are doing here in this consultation, supposed to be, is that we as the people are we are told, given the opportunity to speak to those people who have the final authority and responsibility to give effect to the electoral reform that we are talking about. If I'm, I'm correct, if I'm not correct, you can, you can always uh, pull, pull me up. Uh, in that structure, we have the legislature, which will be the final um, determiner, and the legislature is fed by the executive, the cabinet. But the cabinet gets its form and substance from the party in power. So you have a link between the party in power, the executive, and the legislature. These are three powerful elements there. So what I expect is with these consultations, what I expect them to be is where the people are being told by the executive, to give me your views, you know, Talk to me. Tell me what you, you, you want. The, we were told by the Prime Minister and reiterated by the former chairman before you, chairman of these sessions, that the government is not giving its position because it doesn't want to prejudice the situation. But we know we are all Dominicans, we are all big people. After those sessions at the State House, we then went to Portsmouth and things started to move very forcefully, I believe, into the party political realm. And then that was, I think, continued at Londonderry. Is Mr. Nanton here? Mr. Linton and I are here. Mr. Linton and I are here. So Mr. Nanton came up and he gave a straight party political presentation. In fact, he said that the only party in the country is the Labour Party. He injected that party political thing into the proceedings. You remember I was at the State House. Did I say anything all and all? Very, very statesmanly and everything like that. But Mr. Nanton came to Woodford Hill, the State House. Mr. Nanton came to Woodford Hill to look for me and Mr. Linton to castigate us and to castigate the party which we associated with. That wasn't fair. And then we ended up at the parish hall 
with what we ended up with last night. It was frightening. And, you know, you, Sparks was intimidated, you know, you see he's here now, he came for comfort. Sparks there. Yeah. Very intimidated with what happened there last night. So here we are. But from what has emerged and what we understand, and we are all Dominicans, we are here in Dominica and we know what's happening. What we've been told, and uh, you know, at some stage, if I'm wrong, somebody will correct me, is that talking points were actually given by the, 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 to some people to go to the consultations and speak from those talking points. In fact, I was listening to the audio of the gentleman who presented at Londonderry. And while he was presenting, I was watching the script of what I was told was given to him to say. And on at least two of those items, it was word for word. As I'm listening, I'm watching word for word. So it seems to me that here we are, where we have been told that the people must give their advice, their guidance, their thoughts to the, the electorate. So the electorate can then, you know, use that to formulate the final decision. But at the same time, it seems to me that what was happening is that talking points were given by the party from which the executive comes, from which the legislature comes, to say, that is what you must see. If that is so, that is not right. If that was so, that is not right. That wasn't right. You hoodwink us. They would be hoodwinking the people if that is so. If that is so. But it seems from what I'm hearing that the Labour Party does not want electoral reform. Because if you say you do not want ID cards, some people, we don't want ID cards. Then you do not want the list clean. You do not want any names to come off the list. Once the, you are on the list, names must come off unless you are dead. We don't want the, anything to be done to the diaspora, people being able to come in and vote, and so on. And we don't want anything to do, to, to, to do with campaign financing to be touched. All those are essential elements of what we understand the reform should be. But if the Labour Party through its guidance to the people who are coming to these functions, is that we do not want these. Well, what is this electoral reform about? We want to maintain the status quo. So you are hoodwinking the people. That is what it would be. You understand? And we must be fair. We must be fair. So we come to the question of campaign financing. Madam Chair, the Sir Dennis Byron in his report has never mentioned that the state should fund political parties. Have you seen that there? No, it's not there. He's never mentioned it. It's not there. So where did this thing come from that we are so vehemently... I do not think that the state should fund, fund um, political parties. The party I'm associated with has not taken that position, is not of that position. So where has that come from? When Mr. George presented at the State House, he indicated that there should be a cap on what parties can spend. And he suggested that might, that might be around $50 per registered voter. That's the so political party should not be able to spend more than that. He never said that the state should pay that money. That is why I'm disappointed that um, the Minister for Health is not here tonight. Because at least after the meeting, I would have been able to talk to him and say, partner, you got it wrong. But where is this coming from? So if there's any lingering suggestion or thought that the United Workers' Party is of the view that the state should pay parties campaign um, uh, expenses, that is not so. I have the authority of our political leader, who Mr. Nanton said is not in Dominica, and the authority of the president to say that. So let us put that aside. That is not a talking point anymore. Because the Labour Party doesn't believe that they, they should be given funding from the government. The UWP doesn't believe so. I believe the Freedom Party doesn't believe so either. I believe Todd. Is it Todd? Is it Todd? Well, you're not helping me. Todd. I don't believe Todd thinks so. So no party believes that. So let us stop this red herring. I hear my cousin there vociferously saying that there. You know my cousin? My cousin at the back there. But, but, Madam Chair, we have to be concerned about campaign financing because depending on how that thing runs, outside forces can control the governments, whether it's the Labour Party, 
whether it's UWP, whether it's freedom, whether it's study. If we're not careful, you understand? They give you money, how many million dollars, and they may want to control you. So we all have a vested interest in limiting, reducing, eliminating that. You understand? Let me show you why it's of concern. So Dennis mentioned, and you see I'm, refer I'm referring to the budget. So Dennis Byron in page six of the second phase of his report mentioned campaign financing. And he mentioned the budget of the Labour Party with respect to the 2019 general elections. And let me, let me just take an excerpt as to why we should be concerned about campaign financing and about the people from overseas, the diaspora voters coming in to vote. On the budget, on the budget, it says, further, maximum efforts will be paid, will be made to recruit and transport overseas-based voters as well as to secure appealing campaign paraphernalia to assist in building momentum. You hear that? Maximum effort will be made to recruit and transport overseas-based voters. The, the budget statement goes on. This means that the Dominica Labour Party will have to lean heavily on some of its long-standing friends for direct and meaningful financial support in underwriting the cost of a high energy and focused election campaign. The party, the party could also approach major developers like Range Development, whose principal, Mr. Azari, has been very good to the party. It goes on. In the, now, the approved budget for the campaign 2018-2019 is as follows, and I just need to, need to go to item five. The money is being provided for mobilization of and air transportation for approximately 1,000 overseas voters. And hear this whose participation is vital to our success. And they're coming from such countries as the USA, Canada, Great Britain, US, and the British Virgin Islands, Cuba, Venezuela, Barbados, Trinidad, and Eastern Caribbean Islands. And the figure allocated for that is $5,670,000. So I'm saying, when you have that kind of, when you have, and that's in the, that's in the, in the report, eh? when you have that kind of thing, it means parties can get behold, and that goes for Labour Party, UWP, Freedom Party can get caught up and get beholden to these funders. So that is why campaign financing is important for us to look at it. Mr. John, Julian Johnson, I think, he has been quoted here by um, Sir Dennis, and I think um, uh, uh, Mrs. Knight presented his paper at some forum the other day. He has given some guidance on that, and it may be a useful source for us to pay attention to. So this is not, this is my presentation in this regard is not a partisan thing. It is, it's in the report. There's comment report about United Workers Party as well. You can, you can do that, you can look at it if you want. But that is what we have to be addressing. That is why campaign financing is not something we should just dismiss like that. On the question of influencing, people, voters, and, and so to, 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 in, to, in a direction in which the final deciders would like. I am aware that Mr. Byron and Mr. Skerritt spoke, and that Mr. Ba Mr. Skerritt indicated to Mr. Byron that he must remove from his report that reference to the CCG saying that the elections of 2019 were tainted, and Mr. Byron removed it. So in his first, the first phase report, you will see that comment by the CCJ there that the elections were tainted. But in the final, so in the secondary revi revised phase, you will not find it there. I'm aware also that the Prime Minister advised or asked Mr. Byron to remove from his report reference to fingerprints because that would be a problem and there might be pushback. I'm aware that the Prime Minister had discussion with Mr. Byron and told him to remove reference or modify reference to the presidency. So all these things are there. So when I speak, I speak with that kind of information uh, and position. So let us address these matters. 
Okay? The, Madam Chair, if it turns out, if it is so, that the people of this country are interested in free and fair elections, we all say we are interested in free and fair elections. We have identified those elements that will and have to be addressed in order to bring about free and fair elections. And the authority which has the final responsibility, the body which has the final responsibility and the authority to effect the electoral reform is deliberately blocking it. Then there could be problems. I heard last night a woman, I think she's from St. Joseph, in her presentation mentioned about war, war, war. I gather it was, I wasn't at the parish hall, but I understand there was a gentleman going around with a placard talking about if this doesn't happen, it will be war, war, war. We do not want that kind of thing. And let me just say finally, let me just say finally, the, in that regard, the, I'm finishing. The Caribbean Court of Justice, Madam Chair, the institution which we lean on to give high credibility to Sir Dennis Byron, because he's a former president of the CCG. The Caribbean Court of Justice has said to us with respect to this matter of free and fair elections, he says, without such free and fair elections, the preambular value of the creation on, and maintenance of and respect for lawfully constituted authority would be fatally undermined. The consequences of such a denial, that's a free and fair election, that a reflection on Caribbean history demonstrates include loss of legitimacy, public unrest, and even revolt. That's why the Caribbean Court of Justice is warning us. In the absence of free and fair election, if people are frustrated from getting free and fair election, frustrated from getting the electoral reform which they are saying that they require and they need, if they are frustrated, the Caribbean Court of Justice is warning us that there could be public unrest, there could be um, loss of legitimacy, and there could be revolt. We do not want that in our country, Madam Chair. We do not want that in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. James, for your contribution. Uh, very early on, when you, when you started, I heard you, you would have liked to see some other people here who are family members here, but I'm a privo, so I'm assuming I would have relatives here as well. So if you know any of them, you should let me know after the consultation. Okay. Uh, but thank you very much for your, co your contribution. And just one, one thing that you mentioned in terms of the outcome of these consultations, uh, we really are here to hear your views, and this is why everyone is given an opportunity to speak and express themselves um, as it relates to the recommendations on this report. I would like to call on Jennifer Abraham, after which we will have Paul Carlton and Mr. Lennox Linton. Jennifer Abraham. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the Almighty for today, this beautiful day, and thank him for bringing us here. Can we check her mic, please? One. Go, Go ahead. Yes. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank the Almighty for this beautiful day and for bringing us here. I just pray that whatever we discuss or say here will be for the upliftment of his people, the betterment of his people on earth. Um, protocol has already established, so I want to say good night to everybody. First of all, I would like to say, I, I am not in favor in this is national ID card. I, I would like us, to, I want to recommend voters ID card. First of all, I would like the voter ID card to have fingerprint. We know God is so unique that no two people have the same fingerprint. I would also want to have your name and your number to vote. I also want the date of birth on the ID card. And I would always want, I also want us to have. <laughs> no, I know, right? <laughs> we have the fingerprint, we have the date of birth, we have the name and the number. And then we have the polling station. 
So you know you must go to that polling station to vote. I also want the list to be cleansed. I don't know why they feel because your name on the list, you must vote. You go overseas, you take citizenship somewhere else, then you just want to come back here and vote. That is wrong. And most, why they don't want to clean the list too? Some of the people, they're not on the list and the labor right just giving them a paper with their name on it. They don't even know the, the person. But they put a name that is the dead people and the people that have citizenship. Let us be some people coming in the police station and they can they don't even know the name they have. Especially some Haitian. They come in and vote because they just give them the paper to go and vote. Do we have any evidence of that? Let us be careful about the accusations that we are making, okay? Go ahead, continue. I, st I still not in favor in people. We going to register people overseas. You stay in overseas. Why they should come to register people overseas? That is wrong. I, Leon, the right and Leon just <laughs> even about the electoral reform um, ministers. It shouldn't be people that is acolyte of the Labour Party that in charge of that. We should have ordinary people like you have somebody from the Bar Association. You have somebody like, if it's a minister or a priest, you know, some natural people, not people that is acolyte selling passport. Because up to now, we cannot, that is why we cannot get the list cleansed. Cleanse, and we cannot get voters' ID card. Everybody know, in 2008, the electoral reform decided that they're going to clean the list and give us voters' ID card. And everybody's aware of Mr. Tony email. And everybody that come in the electoral reform meeting from the started and talking about the list shouldn't be cleansed or we should not have voter ID card. All of them just come to confirm what Mr. Tony has to fancy. So, but even the AJ, the, even the AG, I never hear you say, well, after the list clean for five years, then everybody on the list, you know, all he continues saying, as long as you on the list, you're supposed to vote, and that is wrong. Grandchildren going and vote on their grandparents' name in another constituency. All that is wrong. So I am in favor of electoral, I, I am in favor of voters' ID card and the list cleanse. The less cleanse, I have no problem with that. Thank you. Again, I'm going to remind the speakers, when you are, when you are making your, your points, um, let's be careful about making certain statements that are unfounded, that you have no evidence of. Um, let us call on Mr. Paul Carlton. And then we have Mr. Lennox Linton. Wait for the mic, Mr. Carlton. You, need, you will need the mic. You need the mic because it feeds into the rest of the system. So you I must speak for the mic. Paul Carlton. I'm 76 years in this community. And I was so glad it was the first village that taught Dominica to speak English. And we are proud of that. I have learned that the art of speak, public speaking is to stand up, speak up, or shut up. In view of the fact that I was not told what I would be talking about tonight, I have stood to speak up. 
so I will speak up. I have listened to a lot of so-called guys who went to university and other places, and I put them in the bracket that they are dunce. Dunce. But I trust the good God to open up their eyes. I, Paul Carlton, say that the writing for some people is on the wall. The writing for some people is on the wall. There's a political lunatic that come on the radio station every in St. Joseph. His writing is on the wall. My writing is on the wall also in the event that the good Lord would call me tonight. Our writing is on the wall in the event he would call us tonight. You could be 10 years, 5 years. There are a lot of things I would love to say tonight, miss, but don't cut me short. When the new year was opened, I told some people this year going to be a year of death, defeat, and disappointment. Some will die by drugs, some will die by motorbike accident. Let's not go down that road. I am saying that the good Lord has set up and the good Lord will put down. When the good Lord is ready, he will say to the AG, bye-bye. He will say to the PM, bye-bye. The fact remains that all of us are here today and we are gone tomorrow. Gone tomorrow. We have two main problems in Dominica. One, we are ungrateful, and two, we do not have enough people here. I came from New York a couple of days ago to see my family, and people bouncing on people in the Bronx, in Boston, and in other places. We do not have enough people in this country. We need to bring Haitians, we need to bring Arabs, we need to bring Spanish, we need to bring Indians, we need to bring Chinese, and we need to bring Ukrainians, those that are billionaires. Mr. Skerritt, you need to work with the others to bring them here to build up that country. Some will work on farms and other places. We know where they will work. Right. We are to say thanks God for Mr. Skerritt. You may not, well, you have land, you don't want to work. You plant a lot of ginger, you plant a lot of ginger there, and you leave them there. I don't want to go down, I don't want to go down that road. I don't want to go down that road. So I say thanks to PM Skerritt, a man with a 2020 vision, and all this bubbling and bouncing and doing this about electoral reform is to try to bring down this man. But the good book says, those who God bless, no man curse. So we need to bring these people here. On the line of passport selling, passport is sold too late. Too late. Those of you who are involved in the selling of passport, you are to do it faster. The, you laugh, you don't understand. You see this? You see this in my hands? You see this hundred dollars? I will not give it to jam up when I'm done. The days are coming when this is going to be like rubbish. The dollar is going to be like rubbish. We are to say thanks and we are to sell passport faster. I'm inclined to close what I'm saying. You know why we are to sell passport faster? Listen to me and you will learn. The why we are to sell passport faster? The days, you know, you didn't learn in school. The days are coming when there will be one world passport. You didn't know that, spectators. One world passport. One world government. One world leader. Men are fighting for power. Men are fighting to lead. Study the word of God and you will know. China, Russia, North Korea, and other countries, they have to rule the world. They have to rule the world. One world government, one world currency, one world this. We are just a little speck in the basket. 
Elder Paris knows that. Elder Paris, my neighbor, he knows there'll be one world government. This preacher who is coming on the radio every time, the book says you can't serve two masters at one time. I hope that the anointing have not left him. Randy Rodney, I get his name. I hope the anointing has not left him. Tell him I say, based on scripture, he cannot serve two masters at one time. And those who come on the radio and they call themselves kingdom building is a political organization. Try to bring down one man. But Skerritt is love. Skerritt, Roosevelt Skerritt is love. Sometimes I'm inclined to believe Mr. James was born to be a preacher. Mr. Lennox said to me some time ago, Mother Cathy told him to be a preacher. Brother, you are a wise man. You can speak and now I believe that God is calling you to save the Methodist Church. Okay, save Mr. Methodism in Dominica, brother. Mr. It's Mr. not Mr. too late. The book says, today you hear his voice. Harden Mr. not Carlton. your heart. They do not love you, you know, because of your brilliancy. But God will raise you up as he did Martin Luther, John F. Kennedy, and all these great men. We were brought here with chains in our neck. Changing our feet, and they, 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 they take Mon Bruce, Captain Bruce, and all the Bruces, James Bruce's, all the fortifications of Dominica. And today, our children of slaves, children of slaves, trying to fight against one another. Children of slaves, trying to fight one another. Mr. Carlton, I'm I I on the floor for a minute. God bless you. Would you? I was interrupting you to ask you if you had any thoughts on the on electoral reform or on the report, but you have ended your presentation. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Lennox Linton. Can we have some can we have some order please? Thank you. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Mr. Paul Carlton, you have a very generous mood tonight. Thank you, sir. The members of Parliament and the members of Cabinet, very good evening to you. And uh, the observers with us this evening, welcome to the environment of Marigot. The Exercise before us is about electoral reform. And uh, as the children of God on this green piece of planet Earth, we the people, we the people, we the Christians of good conscience, we are committed to operating and to continuously improving a democracy that works for all of us. A democracy in which everyone has an equal voice, everyone has equal opportunity. A democracy in which those who the people periodically transfer the power to govern their affairs are held accountable to the needs of the people. And ladies and gentlemen, that is why we're here tonight. It is part of our collective responsibility to ensure free and fair elections with integrity as the backbone of that democracy. Government of the people, government by the people, government for the people. I'm concerned that these consultations, especially in recent days, have been looking more and more like a Dominican Labour Party campaign to enforce normalization of a tainted electoral process that we're all trying to fix, a process that is unfit for the purpose of free and fair elections in Dominica. 
And as we have been understanding it in recent days, the Dominica Labour Party position on electoral reform, as advocated by some very intolerant, disruptive Labour Party elements in recent consultations, that position is no reform. They don't want ID cards. They oppose fingerprints on ID cards to prevent voter fraud. They want to overturn the rule of law, disqualifying persons resident overseas for more than five years from voting. They don't want campaign finance legislation. They say it makes no sense for Dominica. They're modernizing, you know, but they know it makes no sense for Dominica. They don't agree that the Treasury should give any political party or candidate money for elections. Where is this coming from? Mr. Jay has made the point. Nowhere in the first phase report or in the second phase report is there any mention of the state or the Treasury of Dominica providing money for political parties to campaign. Nowhere. But it has emerged as a major Labour Party talking point in these consultations and a reason to go after opposition politicians, United Workers' Party. They're lazy. They're not, they, they can't do work. They want to take money from the Treasury to campaign. Nobody has asked for money from the Treasury to campaign. There is no position anywhere in this report. And yet, night after night, it comes up. The Attorney General, the chairperson of these consultations, refuses to say that they can find it nowhere in the report. It is not a matter for consideration. It has come from Roosevelt's carrot outside of the consultation, where he's emotively trying to set up the people of Dominica against campaign finance regulation. Not state funding of political parties, campaign finance regulation. And I want to say tonight that campaign finance regulation is necessary because money cannot be allowed to have the controlling influence in a political system such that elections can be determined and or purchased by big money, interest, or criminal enterprises. So campaign finance reform is about solutions to the critical money in politics issues that are negatively affecting our elections. Some time ago, back in 2000, I had the opportunity to speak with Roosevelt Skerritt. He had just emerged as the representative for the Vicars constituency, and we spoke in those days, we used to have live morning television in Dominica, 2000, February. And I asked him the question, based on having just contested the election of 2000, whether he felt, given the challenges of resources and so on, that the time had come for consideration to be given to campaign finance regulation. And his response to me was, and I'm quoting him here, certainly, let us try to level the playing field so that everybody can have a fair chance to make a contribution to this country. There should be some kind of reform as to how we raise money for the campaign and how monies are allocated. That would help tremendously in leveling the playing field, end of quote. Today, Mr. Skerritt is setting up Labour Party operatives around the country to come to these consultations and say that campaign finance regulation means the Treasury has to provide money for political campaigning. But you know what is happening here? Mrs. Skerritt is setting up the people of Dominica. He's weaponizing something that Pierre Charles of blessed memory warned against. It was a Labour Party leader, Pierre Charles, who admonished us in Dominica, do not wear your ignorance as a badge of honor. And much of what we see in these consultations is ignorance parading, is badge of honors paraded in the name of ignorance. People who don't understand what they're talking about, standing and pretending that they are part of a platform 
for reform of the electoral process. While that is happening, Mr. Skerritt and his party have no problem being funded by the public purse. Whether the public purse is money from the sale of passports, and we have sold 46,615 passports between the 1st of July 2016 and the 30th of June 2023. 46,615 passports. The amount of money that should have been collected from those sales, $10.6 billion, $10,600 million. From that, we have only received into our treasury $2.7 billion or $2,700 million. The rest of the money is outside there under private control of Mrs. Carrot and his friends, they can use it to do whatever they want. They can spend whatever they want on their election campaigns. Public money. But he's telling the people of Dominica that nobody else but him and his party should benefit from public funding of, political, of the political campaign. And I want to repeat, we have not asked for public funding. Huh? We have not asked for state funding. We are asking for the influence of big money to be taken out of the politics of Dominica. And there's another thing. We had a very ugly example of abuse of public resources for the purpose of influencing election campaign results. Dominica 2019 it has never happened in the history of Dominica before then, and it has not happened since 2019. The overdraft of central government in that election year 2019 went up to $187 million at the National Bank before the National Bank was forced to say, we cannot extend any further overdraft facilities to you. At that time, Parliament had set $36 million as the overdraft limit for central government. They drove the overdraft up to $187 million in the election year 2019. And then turned around, abuse of incumbency, turned around and converted $125 million of that $151 million into a long-term 30-year loan at the National Bank which we are going to be paying for the next 30 years. That 30-year loan on the back of the poor people of Dominica is part of the election year excessive spending of the DLP to buy influence. And I'm happy to be here tonight to have heard from the parliamentary representative for the Marigold constituency, Tony Charles, the Honorable Tony Charles. Tell us the genesis of some of these difficulties that we're having with the electoral process today. Those were the days back in 2008 when his father, Richard Charles, was a member of the Electoral Commission, the Independent Electoral Commission. And himself and Condwani Williams, according to the Paul Rep from Maragot, we heard it tonight. You know, it's wonderful to come to Maragot, you know, you hear things that you don't hear anywhere else. Because this is the moral capital of the Commonwealth of Dominica. We speak truth to power. We keep it real. And when they ask us to address electoral reform, we address electoral reform. We don't have any mepui to throw. We don't have any jabs to throw at people. We don't come to consultation because we hear other people were there. So we flew in by helicopter. We come because we have contributions to make. And Tony Charles told us tonight, his father Richard Charles, and Condwani Williams were trying to remove some names of dead people from the list. It was described as madness going on at the commission. Madness going on at the commission. And these people were trying to introduce ID cards for voting and to have a complete re-registration of voters in order to clean the list. And Mrs. Kerrid was told, you have to prevent that because it is going to interfere with your re-election legacy, and he did. So for 15 years and five months, we have had no reform. And now, 
what we are seeing is at the point where we're supposed to be moving towards the reform. We have a fight from within Mr. Skerritt's camp trying to protect his re-election legacy. No ID cards. Keep everybody on the list of voters, whether they're overseas or not. And you have the Attorney General, he comes to these consultations and he tells us about Section 32, 33.2 of the Constitution. Mr. A.G., Section 32, Section 33.2 of the Constitution is not a blanket right to vote. It applies to voting in Dominica, based, voting based on residence and domicile, not in Antigua, not in the United States. Not in Guadeloupe or Martinique, not in France or Taiwan or Beijing. It is about voting in Dominica. Residence and domicile in Dominica under the Constitution gives you the right to vote in Dominica. So under that same Constitution, if you're no longer resident or domiciled in Dominica, if you have taken up ordinary residence elsewhere, the Constitution would not be offended if the law provides for you to be taken off the register until such time that you have decided to relocate and to live indefinitely in Dominica. What is so difficult about that? Why are we fighting this? You know why we're fighting it? The pool of overseas Dominicans who are available through bribery at election time to be weaponized against opposition in Dominica and to come in to vote in targeted constituencies, especially marginal constituencies, is a key feature of the winning formula, the so-called winning strategy of the Dominican Labour Party. And they will not let it go. So now, it's almost as though United Workers Party is visiting on Dominica this injustice of overseas people not voting after they've been overseas for more than five years. It is the rule of law in Dominica. That particular law, the Registration of Electors Act, precedes us becoming an independent nation. So we have had it for more than 44 years. And to suggest in these consultations that it is some construct, some creation of the United Workers Party is flat out wrong, and we should stop it because it is the rule of law, the Registration of Electors Act, that provides for disqualification if you have been absent from Dominica for more than five years. We are saying that that provision of absence from Dominica is inconsistent with the Constitution because the Constitution doesn't give you the right to vote based on presence. It gives you the right to vote based on residence. And so any law that seeks to disqualify you from being on the register of voters has to be because you are no longer resident in Dominica. That's all we're saying. And so let's fix, let's fix the law because we're reforming. Let's fix the law, bring it into conformity with the Constitution and bring it into conformity with common sense. And you know, a lot of people make reference to what's happening in Canada, what happened there in 2019 when the Supreme Court ruled against this bar on persons who had been out of Canada for more than five years. The point that they made in the judgment is that the bar was arbitrary because nobody showed the court any evidence how this group of people overseas voting from overseas, would cause harm, would cause harm to the interest of the voting population resident in Canada. So there is a scenario where people from outside who are part of the country, they were born in Dominica, but they've relocated elsewhere. There is a scenario in which those votes can be deemed to be affecting the franchise of the people in Dominica, diluting the votes, or being used in a strategic way to influence results of the votes. In Canada and the United States, 
it has been determined that the number of people who are voting from overseas is so small that it cannot have that effect, especially because nobody is buying those votes to vote, those people to vote. Nobody is bribing them. And look what happened in 2022. Where were all the persons who come in by plane loads and ferry loads into Dominica to vote at election time? In 2022, we didn't see them because the election was boycotted by the main opposition party, the United Workers Party. There was no contest, there was no competition, there was no need for the Labour Party to bring in all these voters from overseas. And you know, we in Dominica would be in the very same situation with Canada, with the United States, in terms of the impact of voters overseas voting in our elections. Because if they weren't getting the money to vote, they would not come to vote. So what we're talking about is the protection of a bribe. The benefit of receiving a bribe at election time to come home to vote, we cannot base reform of an electoral process on that. We must get rid of it because it is wrong, it is corrupt. And yes, I'm, I'm going to say it. If we're going to get reforms that we need in Dominica, the Dominica Labour Party is going to have to reform itself and its posture in the national interest of Dominica. When that reform takes place, we will see an easy move towards the reforms that we need. Right now, they're fighting against reforms that will work for the people. Mr. Linton, I'll be grateful if we can wrap up. We do have a number of other speakers. We've been on for about 20 minutes now. So, thank you. We've given everybody the same okay. opportunity. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for your contribution. We have a few other speakers, so I'm going to call on three more speakers, and then we will take a final round. So we'll have Mr. Gregory Rivera, then we will have Senator Reed, and then we will have Mr. Vandal. Gregory Vare, Senator Reed, and Mr. Vandal. Your name is there, don't worry about that, Mr. John. Everybody's name is there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for allowing me to, to speak from the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to be very brief, but before I, I, I start my presentation, I want to say that maybe we should introduce an ID at those consultations. Because we cannot have people coming to every consultation, saying the same thing all the time, and denying other people the time to talk at these consultations. So I think maybe we need to begin with an ID at those consultations. Madam Chair, my name is Gregory Rivier, better known as Lord Caressa. I served as an election official, I served as a poll clerk, I served as a presiding officer, I contested two elections and lose. Maybe I might be holding the record for the person who lost the most elections in the shortest possible time. But notwithstanding that, Madam Chair, I personally believe that I lost fair and square. I believe the elections that I participated in, they were not tainted. 
They were not loaded with fraud. There was no impersonation. And, of course, if there were, Madam Chair, all my opponents are right here. So they can attest to that, that elections in Marigot and Dominica by extension is free and fair. And if, if that is not so, Madam Chair, I think I will call my lawyer tomorrow. If that is not so. So I, am, I believe that elections in Marigot is free and fair. The only time I think I had a little issue with elections is in 2019 when they burned down the entire village to intimidate my voters. And the people who were supposed to come to vote, they didn't come to vote because of the fear that they had on elections day. That is the time I think election wasn't free and fair, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1995, in 1995, the United Workers' Party won the election in Marigat. Our parliamentary representative, my dear good friend, was the leader, became the leader. No, no, no. He became the leader, which is the prime minister, in 1995. Marigat. Since then, up to 2022, when the opposition decided not to participate in the elections, we've been holding the position of leader of the opposition. My dear friends, are we saying that all these years we have been winning in Marigot, the elections were tainted? Are we saying that all these years we were, they were winning in Marigot, the election wasn't free and fair? They are right here. Let them answer. Let them answer. My dear friends, when I got beaten, when I got beaten, when I got beaten, can, can somebody listen to me? I listen to everybody, you know. And this is the only time I'll talk in the consultation. I, I, I haven't got the privilege like some people that can talk three and four times. Ladies and gentlemen, when I got beaten in the election, I recognized my weakness. I went back to the joint board. I refocused. You know, I decided to mount a different campaign. And that is the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, that I was able to increase my votes by 20% overall. That was the reason why, in one constituency, my vote increased by over 150%. I operated under the same rules, ladies and gentlemen. Madam Chair. I hope you realize how many times they're disturbing me and I cannot um, go through my presentation in time. So my friends, the question is, if the elections in Marigot is free and fair, why do we want to impose restrictions on Marigot people to vote? If the elections in Marigot is free and fair, why do you want to disenfranchise the voters in Marigot? If the elections in Marigot is free and fair, why are you trying to put barrier to make elections in Dominica or in Marigot particular difficult? Why? Why? There must be an ulterior motive, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that we have to do something with the voters' list. I think the voters' list is bloated. But we can fix the voters' list outside of electoral reform. There are procedures in place that we, need to, we can follow to fix the voters' list. We have entities that are supposed to be doing their job. All we have to do is to enforce the existing laws, ladies and gentlemen. We do not have to be spending all these nights, consultation upon consultation, to take off a dead man off a list. To take off a dead man off a list. We don't have to be spending all that money, ladies and gentlemen. 
My friends, I don't believe we need to tamper with the Constitution of Dominica. I do not believe that we need to tamper with the Constitution of Dominica. This has served us well, and I think it should continue as it is. So take, for instance, I've been hearing a lot about this one term for prime minister. Come on. My friends, one term for prime minister or two terms for prime minister. So that is what you want in Dominica. So, so if a man get one term and he fail on the one term, you're going to pray for him to get two terms? My dear friends, if, if the people want you, they will vote for you. If the people don't want you, they will dump you. That is democracy, ladies and gentlemen. That's democracy. And we talk about expanding the, the um, Electoral Commission. What are we going to achieve by expanding the Electoral Commission? What are we going to achieve, ladies and gentlemen? The Constitution gives us two from the government, two from the opposition, and the president determines who will be the chair. That is okay. All we need to do is to get the Electoral Commission to work. And as long as the Electoral Commission works, we don't have a problem. So the problem is not the law. The problem is not the law, ladies and gentlemen. Hold on. Just... Please, Madam Chair, earlier, can I get some protection, on, please? <laughs> earlier on, earlier on, we said, some of the earlier speakers said that, you know, we're not going to, I am not going to have this difficulty in Marigot. But I would, I would really urge us to allow Mr. Rivier to continue, as we've done for other speakers, so that we can hear clearly. Also, we have our stenographer here who is capturing everything. So go ahead, please. Let's have a little bit of order. All right. Let us go to the, um, the proposed registration of electors bill, 2022, page 12. Those of you with your copy, because I understand some people come, came here and they didn't read anything. And they are the ones that stayed the longest on the floor. I read the whole book. You didn't read anything and you come and spend a whole night talking nonsense. So, my friends, let us refer to that. Section 12, page 8. The right to remain on the register. I believe, AG, that subsection B2 should be deleted. And there, if there is a consensus on that, I believe that section 26, 27, and 28 are relevant are irrelevant. I believe as long as you are on the voters list, you have a right to vote. That is my opinion and that is what I believe. As long as you are on the voters list, you have a right to vote. And the only thing that should remove you from that list is when you are dead. And that is what I think. You may think otherwise, but that's what I believe. And that's what I'm that's my conviction. Ladies and gentlemen, I also want to make reference to I want to bring to your attention this question about residency. I've been thinking about it for a while now. And if I mean just think about it. You have an Englishman, an Englishman, an Australian, uh, uh, um, Australian Englishman, Commonwealth people, can come in my country, spend 12 months, register to vote. Now, those are people who live all their life in the other countries. Come to my country, are registered, and have the right to vote. And you're telling me you're telling me that Dominicans who leave Dominica for whatever reason, in some cases to study, in some cases to um, maybe as resident ambassadors, in some cases for economic well-being, are you telling me, my dear friends, that these people do not have a right to vote in our elections? They are Dominicans. They are Dominicans, my friends. Those are the same people who know Monkey Hill. Those are the same people who know Overgutter. 
Those are the same people who drink from simit gutter and pussy gutter. The same people. And now we're telling them that they cannot vote. Even when, in some cases, they contribute so much to our economy. And of course, that should not be a requirement. Or that's not a requirement for voting. As long as you are registered, you have a right to be to vote, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, on the question of ID, I believe, I believe that we can have an ID for voting. I have absolutely no problem with having an ID for voting. But I also believe that the main purpose of an ID is to determine with a greater sense of confidence that a person who is requesting a ballot is in fact the person who should receive the ballot. That to me is the primary objective for having an ID. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to submit that any form of ID issued by the government is more than adequate to vote in any elections in Dominica. Again, we do not have a history of voters' fraud in Dominica. We do not have a history of personification in Dominica. So I see no reason why we need to have a special ID, a specific ID with fingerprint and eyelash identification and all those kind of things just to vote, ladies and gentlemen. I don't see that making no sense in our election. I cannot believe that I can flash my passport anywhere in the world to acquire service. And in Dominica, I cannot flash my passport to go and vote when everybody in the polling station know who Ugly Gregory Revere is. I don't understand that, ladies and gentlemen. So I believe that, yes, we can have an identification, but it could be any identification. In, in places like England, down to a, a, a bill, a, a, a grocery bill, a medical bill, they use as ID. The list of ID is not exhausted. In America, Canada, you use the driver's license. Places like California, you don't even need an ID. If you are, if you're not a first-time voter, over 34 million electors, and they don't need no ID. And in Dominica, where you have uh, uh, Marigot, how much about 800 people vote the last election? Where you know everybody, and you want to bring fingerprint and all kind of print in an election? That is a waste of resources, ladies and gentlemen. Madam Speaker, I'm winding down. Oh, not sorry, not Madam Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, on the question of political campaign financing. I'm going to make it short. If you can raise it, then you have to use it. If you can raise it, then you have to use it. It has some people that can raise it. You can raise it. Why you want to deny me the right of raising it so that I can use it, ladies and gentlemen? I believe that there should be no cap no cap whatsoever on campaign financing. You have the ability to raise your money. You go out there and we are in this thing to win. We're in this thing to win. And if I believe I can raise my money to run my election, raise my money to run my election, and I can tell you that big money doesn't win election. Big money doesn't win election. And if you think I lie, you can ask my brother there in 2000. Big money never win elections. The United Workers Party outspent its opponent three to one, and they still lose the election. I always make reference to Johnson Drago. This man is a goat herder, was a goat herder in Cassie Proust, may his soul rest in peace. Not Johnson Drago, Romanus Banis. Romanus Banis, a goat herder. And this man ran against two doctors who were more wealthy than him, and he bust their skin. Big money doesn't win elections. We need to wrap up, Mr. Rivers. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to wrap up.
You see, that is the reason why you should really speak in plenty of um, consultation. Eh? Just to say to us, friends, I think we have come too far for us to give up our rights to vote. We have come too far to give up our rights to vote. Our forefathers, they bled, they sweat, they died for that right. We had situations where there was a time black people couldn't vote. There was a time when women couldn't vote. There was a time when it was difficult, people were making it difficult and more and more difficult for us to vote. Now we have the right, that, that's not a privilege, now we have the right. I think we need to exercise it. Every amendment, and that's my last point, every amendment from 1776, and we're talking about the US election, was geared at making voting easier, more accessible, and of course, increase participation. Participation is among the core democratic values and principle. Any reform attempt to do otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, is no reform whatsoever. Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested 60 years ago for fighting for us to, to vote. Nelson Mandela take jail for 27 years. Today, those, those two men are our heroes because they stand up for people to vote. 60 years later, now we are coming here in a consultation trying to disenfranchise voters, trying to say that people's names should, should come off on a, on a voter's list because you believe that a particular party has an advantage. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I will do my rest of my submission in writing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rive. And um, this is a good reminder that others, since we are running late already, a reminder that you can submit your submissions in writing to the Cabinet Secretariat's office. Um, hard copy, or you can email capsec at dominica.gov.dm. That would be cab, dominica.gov.dm. So please feel free, Mr. Rivier and others, to submit all of your comments in writing. Um, let's have Senator Reed at this time. Good evening, everyone. I'll be brief because it's 10 past 9. Okay, protocol has been established. Good evening to everyone here. Good evening to everyone here. Okay, so good evening. I have followed the consultation for the past weeks, and there's really nothing that has been left unsaid in terms of further recommendations and suggestions for the new electoral laws. A few things, however, needs to be refreshed in our minds so I will touch and form them. So it's reinforcement time. Because as you know in class, when you have to revise for the exam, you need to reinforce. Okay, so number one, one of the things that stood out for me, who should lead these consultations? Consultations as it relates to the electoral reform or electoral modernization should be led by the chief elections officer and supported by the Elections Commission. It should not be led by any political party or sitting government. So it should not be led by the Labour Party or United Workers Party or independent candidates or whoever. We have an electoral office. We have a chief electoral officer, and that is his duty. Let us be transparent in our undertakings as it relates to reform or modernization. Everything does not have to be political, as has been said many times this evening, but I see otherwise. 
the electoral office should perform its function in every aspect, okay? Number two, confirmation of voters. Dominicans are all over the world, enjoying the benefits that the other countries have to offer. I am okay with this, you know, I'm okay with that. It is our democratic right, it's our choice to live where we please, to enjoy whatever we want to enjoy. Reconfirmation here on our beautiful island should not be a problem. Should you feel that you must be on the voters list, come home to register. Buy your ticket, come home, bring a barrel for granny. She would be happy to see you. Not every five years, the lady have to see you. Come in here. Having a reconfirmation campaign all over the world to accommodate Dominicans overseas who wish to vote here in Dominica will cost the state a pretty penny. And these times, we had economic times. Let us, be re let us be realistic. You want to vote, come home, register. We'll be happy to have you. You can choose to come carnival time. You can choose to come fest. You want to party one time. Okay, come home to reconfirm your name on the voters list. Okay? Now, when I registered to vote, I registered at Maho constituency because I live at Sylvania, which is the correct thing to do because you're supposed to register where you're living. Let's say I ought to move my vote now Let's say to Rosa Valley, because let's say I moved to Loda. I must be living in Loda for three to six months before I can move my vote. So for voters overseas, how will this confirmation process work? We have to consider all these things when we're looking at the electoral laws. We want something, we want it how we want it, we want to twist it to suit ourselves, but we need to do things properly. If we're doing something, let us do it properly. Voters ID card. I've heard about the voters ID card, national, it's been, it's been quite a discussion. Now, a passport, a driver's license, a social security card, and a national ID can't serve the same purpose of a voters ID card. I mean, why do you need the voters ID? We need to ask ourselves, first of all, why do we need the voters ID? Why? I ask you why you need an ID. Why do you need the voters ID? Not only will the voter's ID card be used to inform of your name and eligibility to vote, the most critical purpose of the voter's ID is to reduce the chance of voting multiple times because it bears a voter registration number. That's why you need a voter ID. So the back and forth nationally, I mean, let us be realistic. You already have a social security card, you have a driver's license, you have a passport. The voter's ID is for a separate purpose. Again, it is critical because it reduces the chance of voting multiple times. I have plenty of names. My parents give me plenty of names, you know. I can vote multiple times if I wish to. But I'm a good citizen and I believe in rights. Some people don't. There are existing legislations in the Registration of Electors Act and regulations that gives the chief election officer the authority to produce a card for voting. And the purpose of the card is to prevent voting duplication in any election. That is the important part. We keep skipping that up. Let us remember, reinforcement time, voter ID. Let us avoid the chances of we having an issue about people voting multiple times. And let me just say one last thing. My last point, fixed dates for election. I told you I was gonna be quick. Fixed date for election. We must now put the necessaries in place to govern this country with rules, laws, and processes that enable growth and proper governance. So the Russian roulette, as my parents say it in your pocket, pull it out, put it in your pocket, pull it out. No. The Russian roulette, the hopscotch way of announcing election, it has done its time. I mean, multiple leaders did it. It, it had a time. The time is it gone. So it is time for us to fix this. Let us, we try to improve our processes, not because something has happened over the years. We have to keep it. We make changes. And that's how we improve our lives and the lives of the people around us. So having a fixed date for election here on the island is important. You may say that we did, we, we did it before. You are correct, you know. We did. But it's time to change it. This does not mean that we can't make the changes that will improve the processes for proper governance. Just knowing that every five years, on a set day of a set month, Dominicans will exercise their franchise at the polls. It's important. Not me there wondering when, when is election, boy, what, no, what, no, what is that? It will allow all concerned 
to be adequately prepared for the elections. And it will allow us to not have to deal with the plus election during Christmas time is a no no. I love Christmas. You, no, no, no. We need to fix this. Let's really level the playing field with our electoral process. So we have four points, four reinforcement points. One, who should be leading the consultations? Okay? The chief election officer, supported by the commission. Okay? Number two. Confirmation of voters. You want to be on the list? Come and register. Buy your ticket. You can afford to buy your ticket, or you can't afford to buy the ticket. You can't come to register. You should not. If you can't buy a ticket to come home to register, you shouldn't be here voting. Voters' ID. It is not the same as a national ID. It serves a different purpose, and we know that. Let's not. Let's stop playing around, and let's have a fixed date for the elections. And these are the four points that I think should be reinforced, and if somebody has come here again to speak and say it, it's okay, because it needs to be reinforced. Commit it to your memories. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reed, for your pointed contributions and uh, brief. Um, now, I have five more speakers. I realize it's, it's getting very late, and our attention span is well enough. You have been very, um... yeah, so we have, we have five more speakers and I would ask, I'm gonna call the, the names of those who would like to speak. If you would still like to speak, please raise your hands. We are going to ask you to speak. I'm gonna give you about five minutes because the AG has to wrap up and then we are going to close up after that, okay? so. Uh, the last set of speakers that I have will be Mr. Richard Charles, Mr. Hector John, Mr. Vandal, Mr. Bernard Sanderson, and Mr. Philip Dura. These are the five names that I have. I do not know if all of these people are still in the room. Can you just raise your hands? Okay, do we have uh, Mr. Richard Charles? Um, can we have the mic to you, please? Because it, it will save some time. Okay, and let's thank try you, to be as brief as much. possible. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thought I wasn't going to say anything tonight. These consultations, they have served a very good purpose because a number of Dominicans across the board have participated in this consultation. And those who have not participated, they have listened and many have become conscious or aware of the electoral process. And we look at this situation, it is not a fight. We have to use this opportunity to ensure that we have electoral reform. That this reform will bring accuracy, democracy, and fairness to the election process. We have to do that. There is no if or but. Whether we are peddling our political side, is labor or freedom or UWP, we have to put Dominica first before we put our party. And um, I, I stand here not as representing any party. I stand here as a Dominican, a Marigotian Dominican. I've, I, because of the time constraint, I will deal with just a few issues. One of them is the cleansing of the list. This is an ongoing process that is always taking place. One of the constraints in the past has been the lack of funds and capacity within the electoral office. And this should be addressed because the, in the past, the electoral chief elections officer and the worker, they were ready to do the cleansing of the list, but the lack of funds and the lack of the staff prevented it from happening smoothly. And this is a situation that we have to address. The party and campaign finances. My brothers and sisters, this is a vexing question. And this is a situation where funding for a party can throw out the election and it can bring Dominica into a situation where we become a lawless country. 
We cannot, we have to have a cap. We must have a cap on the amount of money spent in the election campaign. My brothers and sisters, look at our country, Dominica. Look at the poverty that is within the country. Let us look at, we, what we have is the passport. The CBI is what is keeping us going. And when we look at the situation in the constituencies, to have an individual with a big, deep pocket comes in and starts spending money, you know that can tilt the election in, that, in the individual's direction. And that is not a fair election. We also have a situation where persons can do illegal, are involved in illegal activities, can fund the party, and then you have yourself in serious problems. So we have to look at those situations. You can, we have to be accountable. You cannot just take money and you, nobody know where money coming from and money just flowing in the constituency. And at the end of it all, you, you win. You have to answer to those people because they fund your campaign. So this is a situation where we have to have some checks and balances on the campaign and party finances. We have to know what is going on. Money cannot be going. I saw a budget. In the report, it states that how much millions of dollars for the budget. It's a good thing it, the, the, that money wasn't raised, but that is the kind of money that it took millions of dollars for an election campaign. When election done, the same people there are poor and hungry. So let us, let us take this thing seriously and let us address it in a very serious way. We must have a cap. We have, have to have a limit and on accountability on campaign finances. The ID cards. What is the difference between an ID card and a national ID card? A voter ID card and a national ID card. One is specific, the other one covers a number of areas. To my mind, a num some features can be added and when it's added, you, come, you become a national. But there are those who say that voter ID. So there is, we neither here nor there. I don't think we should be beating ourselves over that. Let us, if it's a problem, let us go for the voter ID card. Voter ID card will solve all the problems. We are not going to allow the discussion to go way higher and people getting confused and distorted and don't want to have the electoral reform because of voter ID cards. The, the machinery has already been bought. It is there, lying for a couple of years, waiting for us to decide where we're going. And I think now is the time for us to decide. Let us go to ensure that we have this voter ID card. It, in terms of the issue of overseas voters, I look at this, these overseas voters as persons who have already registered. You register and you come in to vote. Now, this have a, if, you, if you're coming, like my daughter, for example, my daughter, she lives overseas. She comes off and on to visit. She comes off and on just to say hello. If by chance she comes in at a time when the election is called, Nobody paying her, pass, her ticket for her. She comes in to visit her family. She comes, and you want to tell me that she cannot vote in Dominica? You know, I have a problem with that. I have a serious problem with that. Because this is a Dominican. Living, investing in Dominica, living overseas, know more about what is happening in Dominica than even some of us living here. So why... The government has to create the, the enabling environment for the individual to invest, for any individual to invest. So an, an investor has to know what is the enabling environment. And if she wants to invest in Dominica in a bigger scale, she has to know what is the platform, what is the issues that the government, what is the party saying? What is the candidate saying for the constituency? What is the plan for the constituency? What is the manifesto that the party has for the country? So then that will determine whether the individual vote. And that, to my mind, a person staying overseas, registered, 
and being in touch with their country, visiting their country, and following what is happening in Dominica. Why can't they vote? Why can't they vote? There are certain checks and balances. Let us put it in place and allow them to vote. That is my view, and I believe it can help to solve a lot of problems. So we need to ensure that our people, we put Dominica first. Ensure that Dominica, and forget about this, this, this tribal war, this partisan war, it's not going to help us. There are times for it. This consultation is not for it. Let us work together to ensure that we have electoral reform. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Charles. I'm hoping that the speakers after you will also keep it as brief. So Mr. Hector John and then Mr. Vandal. Can we get a mic to Mr. John, please? I will be very brief. Um, I have to drive right back to Salisbury. Um, what is today? Today is the 29th of August. 44 years ago, we had Hurricane David. Today, I was in court for my seventh time. Because I said somewhere in September 2019, if there is no electable reform, there will be civil unrest. And up to now, I am before the court. Good evening to the observers. I want to make that contribution to you. I come from the village of Salisbury. I represented the constituency of Salisbury for 14 years. The 6th, the 5th of December 2019, the day before the election, my sleeping community was tagged and bullied down by the government and regional forces because we stood up for electoral reform. You will not see that on, Dennis Byron's, on Mr. Byron's report. That is why I had to come up there. Last night, I tried to make a contribution down in Rosa, but it was a fish market. I, I, feel, I felt bad for the labor rights they brought there as well who came there and didn't know what they were doing and disrupted a very, a, a, an activity that would have been very constructive. And I, I want to say to our labor, the labor leaders, stop putting Dominicans against Dominicans. We are Dominicans first, you labor, United Workers Party, Freedom, Todd. We are Dominicans first. And what happened yesterday at the Goodwill Parish Hall should never, ever happen again. Mr. Madam Chair, everybody made reference to a letter, an email that came from Mr. Tony Asifans. And nobody read it. But I want to read it tonight. And if the observers want to copy, my email address is hectorsjohn at gmail.com. Hectorsjohn at gmail.com. I can send it to you. That email was on March 27, 2008, from Tony Astephans to Roosevelt Skerritt, C.C. Ali Lawrence, and Hartley Henry. Brother, please don't drift too far. Tried calling you again today and just couldn't get through. I spoke to Kwandwani this morning. There is madness going on at the commission. You need to call in Richard, that's Richard Charles, I just spoke there, my former manager at DBMC, and Kondwani. I live today. These guys are talking about reform to include ID cards and complete re-registration. Such reform will undermine your re-election legacy as the opposition will say, look, the commission agree, agreed with us. Reform was required because of widespread, widespread fraud. Fraud. End of quote. Signed Anthony W. Astafans, S.C. Senior Counsel. Mr. Speaker, um, Madam Chair, that is something I wanted to get out there. People made reference to it, and I wanted to bring it out there. 
There's so, several points that I wanted to bring up, but I just wanted to touch this one on voter ID card. I want to ask a few questions tonight. If you go to the airport and you reach immigration, what they ask you for? Your passport. They don't ask you for voter ID card. You had an accident day once and the Portsmouth police, the Marigold police come to the first thing they ask you for, for what? Right. You go to vote, what do they have to ask you for? Why are we fighting against voters' ID card? It's election we're talking about, you know. And we, I'm hearing the AG pushing that and other members of the Labour Party pushing that. The Attorney General is our, the country's chief counsel, you know. And I'm hearing that type of rhetoric. We cannot be supporting that. Your voters' ID card is critical. Residency. I have about five siblings overseas and tw about 20-something nieces and nephews. They visit every time. I don't want them to come to Salisbury to vote for me. They, they leave, work, and pay their taxes elsewhere. I don't want them to come to Dominica to vote for me. Or the Salisbury. Allow the people in the Guaye to put the government that they want. That's what we are asking for. Why we are fighting to bring in people who do not live here? Madam Chair, I'm going to give you a, 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 just a quick point. As I wrap up, 2008, I was in New York going to school and I came back home to visit. About January, Christmas, 2007-2008. When I got at the airport, first thing I was told by the immigration officer, Mr. John, when you're leaving Dominica, ensure that you get your CARICOM passport. Because by the, at the end of May 2008, no one will be able to use the old passport. So why can't Dominicans come home and register to vote if they want to vote, if they want to be on the voters list? Why do you, don't you come home and meet the requirements? And as I close, Madam Chair, there are members in there who know that I lived in New York and I was with labor rights from St. Joe and Salisbury and other places who were getting the tickets, who were getting the pocket change from people who were giving that to them to come back home to vote. They had no interest in the development of Dominica. The only interest they had was a ticket to go home and pocket change. I rest my case. If you don't get have electoral reform in Dominica, um, observers, we're leading down a road that might be very, very dangerous. God bless. Thank you very much. Um Mr. John, the next speaker that we'll have, and we're trying to wrap up as quick, quickly as possible, Mr. Vandal, and then Mr. Sanderson, and our final speaker is Mr. Philip Dura. So I'm just going to ask the staff to take the mics to them in that order so I don't have to call them again, okay? Uh, go ahead, Mr. Vandal. All right, good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Margot knew me by now, uh, Mr. Vandal. We will. Anyhow. We are about reform, right? I believe that Dominica on a whole needs some kind of reform. And especially concern ID cards. I would say we need ID cards because after you start college, the first thing they give you is an ID to notify you in college with your number, your where you're from, all those sorts of things. So we need a registered voter's card to clarify between voting, driving, Social security and other facts, right? Okay. You say, um, I heard Mr. Linton, Mr. Linton say something about um, residency and docile, right? It, according to you, I want to be, if I'm correct, the docile, the, the, the docile saying that, um, docile, right? That you are here for five years, right? Is that currently observing Dominica already or that in the act from since 1979 or that is the thing that's going to be in implemented now? 
Mr. Linton, the, according to the DOSA Act, right? You are you saying something, I wasn't too clear on it. Whether it's there already or it. So if it is there already, right? And we have people coming down who then. We know the law, the government knows the law very well. I'm not in the government, so I don't know to know the law offhand. But the government knows the law very well. You already have an act in place to correct that. Huh? So that means for the last 25 years, 30 years or so, all of the parties, or I wouldn't say all, but the parties on a whole maybe have been doing that without nobody acting to correct them. So it's like everybody doing their own thing. Because if you have an act where the government is supposed to say, their legislation saying like that is against the law for somebody living overseas to come in and vote for what amount of time. And we're doing it for so much of a time. And look, right now, we've been asking for it to be pardoned. My brother, if there's an act already, correct the act. Correct the act and enforce the act of Dominica properly. You understand? If it's an act already, I don't see why we have today. I'm shading it and hiding it and going up and down. It's already there. Let us enforce the act of Dominica. Too much people taking Dominica for a joke. Let me say something again. I have been listening to the consultation on and off at my home for the past couple of weeks, right? I listen to the lawyers, the priests, the whole bunch of all the talk. Oversee people, everything. Reform is a very important thing in Dominica. But we are not saying what we need to say. We need consultations like this around the clock 24 7. Because there are a lot of things that all governments that pass in there implemented on our backs of the people that the people and them not satisfied with. I want to ask you all a question. Who who employs the 21 people sitting in the constituents of Dominica or in parliament? Who? That is the right question, Paul. Who, who employs them? The employee of the people and them that sit down in the constituents in the, in, the, in the chamber, the 21 of Paul. That is the Dominican people. The people and them that sitting down in parliament, the 21 of Paul, right? Who employed all you? That is the people of Dominica, right? So that means. You are an employee of the Dominican people. The Dominican people have a right to be heard. And you see what we say? The government have a right to take into consideration because as far as I hear it, eh, everybody, we come in to say, we, we say what we need to be said, right? And the government interpret it in their own say and it doesn't involve them because most of what are going on in the country, the government is not really influenced by it. You check? So they're, they're putting things in place that on the back of the people that we really feel in it and they're not. Because things like the reform is very important. But whereas in Dominica Day, where we have our, um, what they call it, our minimum wage being four dollars and fifty cents, if I'm correct, four dollars and fifty cents, if I'm correct, right? And the price of a corned beef, you check what I'm telling you, it's 13 to 14 dollars, my brother. You understand? Scare. Everybody, 21 of all us sitting down there, are we employ. We only wouldn't be feeling like us, the employers. My people, our back will be against the wall anytime because the level of hunger coming to where we live in on credit, whereas of cash. So before times, people used to be living on cash, but we know the economy changing as time proceeds. So let us move in a more state like we becoming modernized. Anguilla and them places there, the minimum wage is either 14 something. Let us get more things like that, more things like that, confront those things so we can talk about things that are really affecting the poor people of Dominica who, who are the employers of the government because the government comes there the government comes there and i i, I just sit down at my home i listen to parliament i listen to the parliamentary de debate numerous times you understand and as far as i hear how parliament going on i only see preschoolers i only hear preschoolers i mean i don't see it most of the time i only hear it i hear preschoolers making noise in a big classroom without no good teacher you understand what i'm saying because everybody wants to talk and it's like a noise 
We give all your work to do. We give all your 21 of all that is speaking to every single body. We give all your work to do as the employers. Do our work for us and don't have Dominican people as a joke, my brother. I listen to that every day and I hear in the government, the 21 people we put there for us to represent us, having Dominican as a joke. So we need more consultations like these to really understand what are on the minds of the people, not just the election reform. I know that is a major concern on everybody back, but that is joke concerning to the major things that we need to be heard in Dominica. So Thank we need consultations Vandal. like that so we can resolve many more problems that occur in our, in our community. Like our youth, because we, our youth need jobs, we send too much people overseas for education. And when they say you're they overseas and they can't get a job, why, why do you used to have Dominica? We is green and we have how much rivers? And we can't send overseas a bottle of water to Ukraine right now. Ukraine at war. South Africa need water. We should have planes. I don't see why we have to be selling passports. I don't thank, see thank, those thank things you. there. Thank you very much. Thank and you, we Bonner. need more consultations, my yes, dear. Yes, we, we need we more consultations. We will have to have a special for you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Vandal. Uh, can the next two speakers be very brief, please, Mr. Sanderson and then Mr. Philip Dura. Good night, everyone. Before recommendations are made, I am going to refer to certain aspects of the electoral process that have been used over the years to elect parliamentarians. This will provide the context for the recommendations. Now the Constitution recognizes the Almighty as the sovereign of the country and as supreme ruler. It is therefore responsibility to obey the Almighty in all aspects of our lives. There's a verse from scripture which states, stand firm for justice, Witnesses for the Almighty, even if it is against yourselves or against your parents and relatives. I will repeat this verse. Stand firm for justice, witnesses for the Almighty, even if it is against yourselves or against your parents and relatives. This is a command from the Almighty. And it is our responsibility to obey. So those of us who have been promoting this honesty, and deceit and bribery and corruption in the land have been guilty of promoting injustice in the land. And in promoting injustice in the land, we have been guilty of defiantly disobeying the Almighty. To have a majority in parliament and thus form the government, 11 seats are required by a political party. For every election, in order to ensure that the Labour Party remains in power, Labour Party operatives do a thorough analysis. But before I say that, let me state that there are six constituencies that are safe seats for the Labour Party. All right, I've been corrected, eight seats. The Labour Party always wins those seats. Now, in order to ensure that the party remains in power, it means 11 seats. So for every election, Labour Party operatives do a thorough analysis of voting trends in other constituencies. That will take just agree with me. Right. So they do that thorough analysis in other constituencies besides the six. They then determine, they then target some constituencies and determine the number of voters from overseas that will be required to come to Dominica to vote so that the Labour Party can win those constituencies, win those elections, and thus remain in power. The Labour Party leadership then uses agents in North America and Europe and other Caribbean islands to aggressively recruit Labour Party supporters. Please let me finish. So, so, so that's what the Labour Party leadership does. It uses agents in North America, Europe, and other Caribbean islands to aggressively recruit Labour Party supporters. 
planes and ferries are then chartered to transport those voters. They vote on election day and return after one or two days. In so doing, they determine the outcome of the elections in favor of the Labour Party. This practice of, this, of the Labour Party is unfair, it is deceitful, it is in support of bribery, and it's a form of injustice. In pursuing this practice, the Labour Party leadership has been guilty of defiantly disobeying the Almighty. In July last year, in July last year, in a ruling related to an elections petition matter, the CCJ stated that, the Caribbean Court of Justice stated that the electoral system in Dominica was tainted and that future elections should not be held under existing or similar taints. The Labour Party leadership defied the CCJ and held elections in December last year. In addition, the Labour Party leadership had approved the payment of over $600,000 to Mr. Dennis Byron to advise on electoral reform. So two and a half years before elections were constitutionally due, and before the Byron report was completed and submitted, the, Le the Labour Party leadership went ahead and held elections in December last year. In holding elections in December last year, the, the Labour Party leadership was promoting injustice in the country and defiantly disobeyed the Almighty. I want to point out that, well, all of us know, let us note that the main opposition parties boycotted the elections in December last year. The opponents, keep quiet, doctor. The opponents of the Labour Party were mainly independent candidates. So it is clear that the Labour Party was expected to win those elections. They were expected to win. It is interesting to note, it is interesting to note that not one plane was chartered to transport overseas voters. Not one ferry was chartered to transport overseas voters. Because we expected the Labour Party to win. All right? However, the Labour Party leadership used social media and the campaign rallies to encourage voters resident in Dominica to turn out to vote in large numbers. The, election, the voter turnout was 30%. This is further evidence that the Labour Party leadership depends heavily on the use of voters overseas to remain in power. That's, that, that evidence is clear. And that is why the Labour Party leadership is determined to prevent the kind of electoral reform that will ensure that voters from overseas do not interfere with the outcome of elections. Now let me move on to recommendations now. As I said, the reference, the reference I was making would provide the context for the recommendations. Um, let me move on just, to recommendations. Just, hold on, Mr. Sanderson. You see, it's getting very late and people are restless. So the longer you continue, the more restless we are going to get. I'm just going to make... I'm just so let's wrap up quickly, I'm going to please. make... Three of my seven recommendations. I'll leave all the other four. All right? Thank you. Three of the seven. Electoral reform recommendations. The electoral system that we come up with should be one that ensures that we do not facilitate treating bribery, dishonesty, and injustice. Under the present legislation, a citizen of Dominica who has been away for more than five years and returns to Dominica two months before an election will not be allowed to vote because of the three-month residency requirement. However, a Commonwealth citizen, a citizen of another country who has been resident on island for 12 months 
will be allowed to vote. In this case, it is clear that the Commonwealth citizen is allowed to vote because of the satisfaction of a residency requirement. But the Dominican citizen is not allowed to vote because of the failure to satisfy that residency requirement. This is, it is clear then that the framers of the Constitution placed a strong evidence, a strong emphasis on residency in relation to voting. Why this strong emphasis on residency in relation to voting? It is because voting is about governance. We vote to elect representatives to represent us where we live. So it is against the spirit of the Constitution and undemocratic and an injustice for voters who reside out of Dominica to be allowed to return here to determine the outcome of elections in favor of a particular party. Let me do the restructure of the Electoral Commission. Presently, the Electoral Commission consists of five members. Two nominees of the ruling party, two of the opposition, and one appointee by the president. The Electoral Commission is supposed to be independent. The framers of the Constitution expected the members of the Electoral Commission to be independent thinkers who would stand firmly for justice and not allow themselves to be influenced by politicians or other individuals. From 1978, the year of our independence, until 2008, this worked well. We had an independent, we had independent electoral commissions. But from 2008, after the Labour Party leadership interfered with the work of the electoral commission and prevented it from cleansing the voters list and issuing voter ID cards, the electoral commission has functioned as an arm of the Labour Party. Up to today, this is still the case. So in order to restore the independence of the Electoral Commission, I agree with the restructuring. My suggestion is that membership should be increased from five to seven, one nominee from the ruling party, one nominee from the opposition, and the other five nominees should come from private sector organizations, religious organizations, um, the Bar Association, and the labor unions. In relation to the electoral, electoral reforming electoral commission, I'm recommending that the first step in the electoral reform process should be the enactment of legislation to, 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 to restructure the electoral commission. Mr. Sanderson, we are going to have to take the two of your seven points because it's because uh, the audience is getting wary. So can you wrap up on this electoral commission yeah. point and then yes. we are moving I'm, to I'm, Mr. Duro. I'm going, I'm, going, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to wrap up. All right, I, let me just, the final thing, let me, let me deal with the establishment of an independent committee and then wrap up, okay? okay? After these consultations, All right, after, I'm wrapping up. After these consultations, it will be hypocritical and the betrayal of trust for the Attorney General and the rest of the Labour Party leadership to decide on their own what sort of electoral reform proposals should be submitted to Parliament for approval. In order to make these consultations meaningful and to serve the best interests of the people of the country, we need to set up an independent committee which will evaluate the recommendations from those consultations and put together a report of proposals for submission to parliament. Thank and I'm saying much. that the new reformed Mr. electoral Sanderson. commission should review this report before submission to parliament. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanderson. Even the people who live in Marigot would like to go home and you and I live much further than they do. So we have the final speaker, Mr. Dura. I'm hoping that you can be as short and as brief as you can so that we can have a wrap yes, up. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, 
Madam Chair, Lady. Yeah, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, AG and the observers and um, well-wishers. Um, let me first say that my views expressed here by Mr. Dura is the views of Mr. Dura and Mr. Dura only. And I don't rec um, I'm not representing any political party. I want to categorically make that clear. Um, I want to be brief. I will be around four minutes. And I want to go straight into um, the middle of the Byron report. Um, in terms of uh, what I understood is that there are centers that are going to be set up um, in certain areas around the world, for example, in New York, in Washington, in London, and probably in Paris, um, where people can go and um, register. Uh, I'm, I'm not supportive of this because uh, Dominicans don't only live in, live in those jurisdictions. There are Dominicans in many places around the world. And if all Dominicans out there are not given a fair opportunity, they will be disenfranchised and the process will be unfair. So I think in my humble, humble opinion, if you're interested in your country, if you love your country like I do, and I'm, I'm sticking here, you would pay your money, come here, have yourself registered, and be part of the process. So that is, that is my view on having centers out there to help people... Um, registered. Uh, my other point is on the voter's ID. I work at an institution where I wear an ID, and if I don't have my ID, I cannot be a place of work. Um, and if, if I'm not identified through my ID, I cannot be allowed to proceed to my place of work. And um, I know a lot of speakers before me have spoken on the whole issue of you get an accident and the police ask you for your driver's license, not for your passport. You go to the doctor, your medical insurance, they ask you for medical insurance, not your passport. Um, so I think something as, as, as secret, I mean, I, I see voting once five years as a very secretive thing and an opportunity um, for anybody. So in that regard, I think um, you should have something specifically to identify you as a voter eligible for voting. Because I'll tell you about my, my last, my, 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 my experience in 2019. When I went to vote, I, I identified myself and the post clerk looked on the list and she saw my name. And she said to me, your name is there, you can vote. But I saw my brother's name. So I said to her, you, you, I don't have to present no ID. She said, no, your name is there, you can vote. So I said to her, what if I had identified myself as my brother's name? Um, would I be allowed to vote? She said, well, let's not get into that. Your name is there, vote. So I voted. But that stayed at the back of my mind because I'm saying... I could have gone to another area within the district, identified myself as Philip Dura, my name is on the list, and I would be allowed to vote, and I'd have voted twice. With a voter's ID, that would be eliminated because I would have a polling number, I would have other demographics that would specifically tie me to a specific area. So, in a nutshell, I would be happy if we could have a voter's ID card to identify ourselves when we go to vote. Um, it's not new. I mean, a lot of the other Caribbean countries have already done it. Jamaica, St. Lucia, Antigua. You know, so why should we always be last? Why should Dominica be always be last in implementing things that is in the interest of the people of the country? You know? So let us not be last this time. Let us, let us, let us get voters' ID and then everybody can be happy and satisfied. My other point is access to media. I think all political parties, no matter what background they are, they should have access to public media and also to private media. And if one political party is allowed on a private media, um, then all other political parties should be allowed at the same time on the private media, given a, a fair enough time. On the issue of, of diaspora and votes, um, for me, I don't think it's fair to, as they say, disenfranchise the diaspora. But the, there's legislation, voters' legislation, which says that if you are out for an election cycle, which is five years, then you should be, you should, your name should not be on the voters' list. I mean, I see this as fair. On, on the Byron report, it says that if you are in the country for 90 days, and they were proposing 50 days. For 90 days, it works out to be around 17 days per year. I mean, it's not asking for much from you. You take your vacation, you come here, you spend some money, you send a barrel, you sh share some time with your family, and you'd be eligible to vote. The problem I have is that you don't see people for 15 years. They don't even help their family. They come to vote the same day, and they back off the same day. 
That cannot be fair to me as a taxpayer of this country. It cannot be fair. If you meet the criteria, you within the 90-day period, 45 years, of course you should vote. And, and, and um, I have no objection to that. But I think also you should find your way here on your own. Thank you. And in closing, closing, I want to, I want to close. Please um, do. I believe that consultation like this are very important to get the, the view of the people. But I hope that the views of the people will be expressed in the final draft legislation. I hope that that is the outcome. And ladies and gentlemen, Thank let you. us remember, I want, to, I want to put this out. Today, the Labour Party is the leadership of this country. Tomorrow, another political party may form the leadership. Will we be satisfied with the legislation that, is, that we want to propose now when it comes the other way around, when we may be in opposition? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dira. Let's allow the Attorney General to make some... We listen to you, so let, let's allow the Attorney General to make some closing remarks. And we shall close. Eji? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to try to run through a few points um, as briefly as I can because we all need to go home. The first, the first point I'm trying to address is the is the suggestion made by one of the, the contributors that the government of, is opposed to elective reform. Well, the, the, the reality is that the, this government is the only government that has taken active steps to secure electoral reform in, this, in the history of this country, certainly post independence. That is a fact. It's incontrovertible. And I'm not asking anybody to add to it or otherwise seek to controvert it because I have been actively involved in the process of seeking to ensure that we get legislation for the purpose of electoral reform from at least 2015. I go back and look at my records and there are drafts of electoral reform legislation going back to 2015. So I cannot be at any meeting or any place and hear anybody suggest that this government has not taken active steps towards ensuring electoral reform. Now, have there been differences of opinion between the government and others? Yes, and it is that that essentially has been the stumbling block. Hopefully, on this occasion, we'll be able to find sufficient points of agreement that we can at least start moving along the road to electoral reform. Because electoral reform is a process, it's not a one-time event. So hopefully we can make some, some headway. Secondly, one contributor said that the system, or electoral system, is, is flawed and broken. I would like to say that that is not correct. Of course our system has challenges, like any other system, but the system that we have here is the same system that we've had from 1978, and it has worked for all parties. The Freedom Party was in office and won three elections under it. The United Workers Party won an election under it. And the Dominican Labour Party has won several elections under it. Now, can we and should we seek to improve it? Yes. And that's part of what this process is about. Thirdly, the point was made about somebody who renounces their citizenship. We may not agree with that. We may, may have our personal views. But we, most of us here have said that we abide by the laws, as they are, not as we would like them to be, unless and until they are changed. The current law in Dominica allows a Dominican citizen to renounce his or her citizenship. That's a sex, section 11 of the Citizenship Act. And it also allows such a person to regain their citizenship, section 12. You can go and look it up. It's, it's a chapter 110 of our laws. So. The law as it stands now allows a Dominican to renounce citizenship and then at a certain point to apply to regain their citizenship. They would have to pay a fee, but they can regain their citizenship. 
The Electoral Commission, the question was asked, who should be in control? I've addressed this previously, I'll address it again. The Electoral Commission is established pursuant to Section 57 of the Constitution, and the, elect the role of the Electoral Commission is set out at um, se Section 38 of the Constitution. Section 38 of the Constitution says, in brief terms, that the role of the, of the Electoral Commission is that it shall be responsible for A, registration of voters for the purpose of electing representatives, and B, the conduct of elections of representatives and senators. That essentially is the role of the Electoral Commission. Section 51 of the Constitution addresses the further role of the Electoral Commission in a situation such as we are dealing with. Section 51 provides that every bill or reg reg regulation or other instrument that has to have the force of law must be provided, submitted to the Electoral Commission before it goes to the House of Assembly, to Parliament. That is the obligation that is upon the government, the, um, the executive branch, insofar as electoral reform is concerned. So, what we are discussing now, all of what has taken place, all the drafts, they cannot just go to Parliament. The government would have to submit those drafts to the Electoral Commission for its comment. And it's not my word, it's the, it's the Constitution. It's a, it's a Section 51. I'm not going to read it because time is of the, offense, of the essence, but you can obviously read it in your own time. And what it says is that they have to be submitted in sufficient time to allow the Electoral Commission to be able to review the drafts and to be able to provide comments on those drafts. And once that is done, then obviously the government will consider the, the, the comments and they may or may not um, go along with them. So that's, in a nutshell, the position as regards the suggestion regarding who should, as it were, um, engage or initiate this process. Mr. Mr. John, my, my friend Mr. John, um, addressed me directly um, in relation to Salisbury. And I'm, I'm, afraid, I'm, I'm afraid, Mr. John, I have to disagree with you on the point of why Police, police officers and regional officers were in Salisbury at the election point 2019 you talk about. It was not because Salisbury was standing up for electoral reform. It was because Salisbury was on fire with riots. That's, what's a, simple, that's a simple goal. I'm not going to go into detail because the matter is before the court. But of course the world is hearing me and they, and they can go back and see the videos. Well... The, 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 the next point, Madam, Ma, um, Madam Chair, is the CCJ. It is quite unfortunate that the CCJ is now finding itself the poster child for um, disinformation, I would say, because the case that is being referred to and um, inappropriately extracting conveniently the words of part of that case has to be addressed, and I'm going to address it, in clear terms. The case was, and this is what reading from it, the central issue in the case was whether the decision of the trial judge was final in the sense in which the word is used in section 40, subsection 6 of the Constitution. The, the justices of the CCJ then went on at um, paragraph 55. Well, we can go to 77, but I'm going to 55 first. 55 says, 55 is the president of the court giving the, the majority judgment of the court, says it would be, I'm going to read all of it so that everybody, I'm not misleading anybody. It would be remiss of, if the court did not, however, offer the following observations. And that's after he said that the appeal was dismissed as a 54. For the reasons above stated, the petitioners must be denied permission to appeal the judgment of the court of appeal. That was the substance of the case. In other words, the petitioners lost the case. But a passa, the court decided, some might say not very wisely, but that's a, 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 for another day, to go on and say this, 
It would be remiss if the court did not, however, offer the following observations. Some, some of the allegations raised by the appellants are serious, mind you, allegations. And if true, and Mr. James earlier in his contribution said, if that is so, when he was making a reference to something. In other words, he was making the point that if it is true what he was saying, then it was something. And if it wasn't true, then it fell by the wayside. But to continue, the allegations, some of them, if true, would be troubling. And he went on to say periodic elections that are free and fair are the lifeblood of a country's democracy. None of that and none of the rest of what is said in that paragraph, most of us inside here would dispute. But what I think is necessary to draw to the attention of this gathering and others is that whenever you hear it quoted, you never hear them say that the court said, if true. What they say, they give the impression that the court adopted and accepted that what was being alleged was true. And the court could not do that because there had been no evidence led. In the, in the high court, there was no evidence led. The application was made to strike out the, the petitions, so there was never any evidence, and there never has been any evidence on those issues. That is the fact of, this, of the matter. And the, the, the other, the other I'll, I'll refer to 108, because someone was saying read, read 77, but I believe 108, which is, all right, well, well, I'll read it in a minute, but I'll read 108, which you might like even better. What 108 says, however, there remain areas of grave concern. Is that not what you're referring to? All right. Right. Well, 108. Well, I don't have 77. Bring it to me and I'll read it. I have what I have selected out. But I, 108 is saying there remain grave concerns. Thank you. There remain grave concerns. And that was the minority decision. Um, Mr. James was asking me to read seven, um, 77. I generally try to be very fair in my discourse. Um, I don't even see, Mr. James, that you have put 77. And I know what you, you me and you, we know, I, we know each other well. But I, as much as I, I love you, Mr. James, as you love me, I'm not going to read something that doesn't, not even on your, your document say 77. There's nothing here. What you say is, what you have here is, no, no. What you have, what he has at the top is there remain areas of grave concern, which I just read, and then the next quotation is without such free and fair elections, which I already read at 77, at 70. I'm too old a fox to be caught by those words, those tricks. Uh, the next and substantive issue is the issue of residence. And the issue of residence, and Mr. Linton referred to the AG by office a number of occasions. It is not me that's saying what is the requirement of a residence. I read section 33 of the Constitution. Section 33, 2B says what it says. It's not the AG or Levi Peter that's saying it. It is the Constitution that's saying it. You can read it on your own and determine. You might not like it. If you don't like it, then do what you need to do to change the Constitution. But don't blame me. It says every person who is registered, not who wants to be registered, who is registered, as aforesaid, in any constituency, shall, unless he is disqualified by Parliament from voting in that constituency in any election, be entitled so to vote. And I told you, and I read it to you, this qualification, and I have before me the Registration of Electors Act, that's dealt with at Section 6. That I can read, Mr. James, because I can see it. It says Section 6, and it reads... A person is disqualified from being registered as an elector and shall not be so registered if he, A, is a person found or declared to be a person of unsound mind or a patient in any establishment maintained wholly or mainly for the reception and treatment of persons suffering from mental illness or men mental defectiveness by virtue of any written law. B, is undergoing any sentence of imprisonment in Dominica. C, is under sentence of death imposed on him by a court in any part of the Commonwealth or under sentence of imprisonment, whatever name called, exceeding 12 months imposed on him by such a court or under some sentence substituted, therefore, by a competent authority and has not suffered the punishment to which he was sentenced or received a free pardon, therefore. Or, finally, D, is under any written law disqualified for registration as an elector. Those are the disqualifications that the, that the Constitution and the legislation provide for. They do not provide for anything else. 
No. No, the issue of taxation was mentioned in respect to overseas voters. We could not have a situation where overseas voters, Dominican citizens who are overseas, would be required to, to be able to vote based on their taxes, whereas locals, Dominicans living here, are not required to vote based on their taxes. There are many Dominicans who pay no tax. The actual threshold at the moment, as I understand it, is $30,000. So anybody earning less than $30,000 pays no tax. So what's, what are we saying? That they, shouldn't, they should not be allowed to vote? I suspect that's not what is intended. And coming to the end, uh, Madam Chair, the, well, yes, Madam Chair, there are many issues, and, the, and some of them are substantive. And it, it is important to draw the attention, I suggest, to the fact that in, in this, in this um, entire process, it is really, maybe I should say this, I think, it was, I think it was Mr. Linton who is looking at me, who said that in Marigot we hear things that we don't hear anywhere else. And the reality is that that is true. And Mr. Linton knows that insofar as the electoral election process is concerned, what has happened over the years is that we have been wrangling and wrangling and wrangling. And what we really need to do, as I said at the outset, is to come together, agree those matters that can be agreed. Uh, the issue of identification cards, although I hear people saying that the government is opposed, as far as I'm aware, the government is not opposed to identification cards. There, is, there may be a, a difference of opinion between the parties as to what, what should be included in the identification cards. Those are matters that I would suggest that it should be possible for the various political entities to get together and discuss. Should we include this? Must we include this? Is it necessary to include this? Can we have something that achieves what we want, which is to make sure that the person who turns up at the poll is the person who it's supposed to be? Can we arrive at a point where we can get to something that works for us? And Mr. Linton, I'll not play the audio again. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much, A.G., for your um, summary and response and wrap-up. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let me take this opportunity to thank you very much for being tonight. Thank you for your feedback, your opinions, and your comments. Um, you have been very patient, and you have been very um, considerate. We are here because we wanted to hear the views from the community, and we've heard a lot of views tonight. I have to add, um, in closing, that I've realized from the feedback over the last two weeks that the people that are speaking, the voices that we are hearing are not just the voices in the room. A number of people are following on the radio, they are following on the live stream, they are commenting. The next day there is always a conversation ongoing. So I'm pretty pleased that we've been able to engage a large percentage, I would say, of Dominicans both here and overseas on this matter of electoral reform. And as much as we say when we speak, that we do not, we are not interested or we do not want to hear. This is the reason why we are here and everyone is being allowed to be part of the conversation. So I would like to, to underscore that. Tomorrow, we move to Kalinago territory at the Sally Bear Primary School. Um, and then we have a final virtual consultation which will be held on Thursday to capture the views of the diaspora and other members of the public who have not been able to join us in person. So at this time, I would like to thank the observers who have been here with us for the evening, and all of you, again, for your patience, the members of cabinet and the residents of Marigot, and further afield, Salisbury and Roseau and Goodwill, who have joined us this evening, and those of you who have been coming to all our consultations, um, like Mr. James, uh, as part of our team almost. But thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Um, and if anyone knows my family, they can direct me, Mr. James, to them in Marigot. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, and please get home safely. Um, we do have some light reflections.